IB Nation, welcome back to another edition, a special edition of the Irish Breakdown podcast. Today, we are doing a special mailbag edition for Irish Breakdown with the goal of raising awareness and funds for the Strikeout Cancer Initiative that the Notre Dame softball team is doing today. So today's format, we are joined by head coach Deanna Gump. We will get to coach in a second, but today's format is we will all the questions we will answer are only super chats. There's also a link in the description box below that will take you to the Notre Dame site if you want to give directly. We ask people to do two things today. Number one, if you can give directly to the site. And then number two, in order to engage in the mailbag today, we're going to answer super chat only questions today. All the proceeds that we get, now Google's going to keep their cut, but all the percentage that all the money that we get that Google doesn't keep. We are then going to donate on behalf of Irish Breakdown. So we're going to try to get to this twofold. And, Coach, I first want to begin by thanking you. This is Coach Deanna Gump. She's the head softball coach at University of Notre Dame. This is year 22 for Coach. She has uh, 844 career wins. So if you have not been paying attention to the softball team, uh, please do so. Coach Gump is the only the only thing that could keep, co- keep Coach and Notre Dame out of the NCAA tournament was COVID-19. That's the only thing that could keep them out of the NCAA tournament during her career. And coach is five wins away from passing Muff, Coach Muffin McGraw for the most wins of a Notre Dame coach in history. So, uh, coach, obviously another season. You had a great year last year. Obviously, won forty wins. Forty had won forty games again last year. You guys are back at again this year, coming off a W yesterday. Uh, you're now nineteen eight and one on the season. But today, coach, we're going to get into your team. But today, we're doing something a little bit different, and we are partnering together because we are trying to raise awareness for uh, childhood cancer in the area. And I just want to begin, Coach, and allow you to just talk to the folks about what we're doing, and then we'll get into some other reasons. So first, begin with, Coach, if you just kind of let people know what you and you are raising money for. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on today. Um, I'm super excited about this weekend. This is something um, that's really special to our program. And what we're doing is we're raising money for the kids and families in our area, just in this our community, um, and about you know, the, our region um, who are fighting cancer and all the money that we raise goes immediately to those families and those children who are fighting cancer to help them with, boy, we, we've paid for so many things already. And I can go down the list if you want to hear it later, but it all goes to help those families and those children. Coach, obviously the Notre Dame softball team. And one of the, the great things about covering Notre Dame for me is I grew up a Notre Dame football fan. So I saw, I grew up on the the winning and losing the amazing thing that I've seen it, since I came to Notre Dame, started covering the team, is how involved all the athletic teams are in the community, not just here to play football, play softball, play basketball. You guys already do a lot, and your 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 team is like a lot of the other teams. You guys are constantly in the community, tr- constantly trying to help out. And of course, this is a, a a great cause, but this is also a very personal cause for you, Coach. And I want to, if if you can share with the folks why this would be an important cause no matter what, but why for you, it's beyond just important. It's also very personal. Yeah. And like you said, the, you know, this place brings a lot of really great people together. And um, I saw it firsthand um, in 2010 when my daughter was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, And at that time it was the, probably the scariest, um, time in my life and the worst time in my life. And um, the one thing I know for sure is Notre Dame um, put their arms around my family and my daughter and did anything they could to help um, us in a time that we really needed um, support. And since that time, um, it is a commitment that I have made to our family and to the softball program that we're going to keep giving back um, to these families and these kids because we understand firsthand how hard it is and a nightmare it is, and that um, anything we can do to help these families um, just brighten their day, if nothing else, like make things a little bit easier in the worst time of their lives, we're going to do it. So, Coach, when you look at your team, obviously, how have your how's your team, how have your players sort of embraced 
not just the community aspect, but this particular per, this particular cost. Because I think the interesting thing is they all they, there's a page, and it shows how much each individual player <laughs> is is raising. So uh, I, I'm I'm curious about kind of the, the competitiveness if if there is any that also exists with with your team. Well, if you I don't know if you noticed this, but the longer you're here, the more money you raise, and I think that's because they understand. Once you're part of this um, and once you're part of our strikeout cancer weekend, you want to always be part of it. And to your point about, you know, how important it is to our players, it has become our unofficial um, alumni weekend. And we get so many of our players who come back just to, because they want to be they want to come to trivia night and they want to do home run derby. Um, and so they want to be part of um, just the, the joy that giving, uh, you know, there's such a joy in giving and um and making a difference. And I, I know that our alumni and our players feel that during this weekend. I think that's why it's everybody's favorite weekend of the year. Well, speaking of favorite weekend of the year, Coach, we'll, we'll get into more of, of just what the cause is and what the, this this fundraising goes to. But like you said, you're going to make it a whole weekend. So you guys, Friday night at 6 o'clock, you, you uh, start a three-game series, weekend series against Pitt. And this is going to be a big part of what you of what the whole weekend is going to be about. So you have a game Saturday, Friday night at 6 p.m., a game uh, Saturday at 1 p.m., and then a Sunday game at noon at Melissa Cook Stadium. So in town, it's home weekend. Sunday, home run derby. I'm, I want to hear all about what you guys have. And people that are in the community, obviously, this is another chance for you to come out and not just support the cause, but to support the women's softball team, which if you're someone who is a Notre Dame fan because you value excellence and you grew up on tradition of excellence with Notre Dame football, this is a program that is about excellence. As we mentioned, uh, Coach has led her team to the NCAA tournament every single non-COVID season that she's ever had. A tremendous program. So a chance to come out and support uh, your team. Uh, not just on the field, but also with this great call. So talk to us about this weekend, Coach. You said it's it's like an, a, a, sort of like a, a alumni weekend, but just what all the things can people expect if they come out to see you all this weekend? Well, first, we're going to see some great softball. Um, we're playing Pitt. Um, they're a good program who, you know, every time we play Pitt, they bring their very best softball here. So we're going to see some really good softball. Um, but after Saturday's game, uh, we do a trivia night, and then we hold it over at – um, the Cubs performance uh, facility, South Bend Cubs performance facility. And um, it's just a great night of celebrating, um, you know, making a difference for those families. And then Sunday after our game, we're doing a home run derby open to the public. Um, and I think it's like 10 bucks, 10 swings. Um, and a little birdie did tell me that Marcus Freeman's coming <laughs> to hit some bombs at our place. So um, I don't know when he's coming, but that's the word on the street. So I'm excited. I think we're going to have a great turnout. It's going to be a beautiful day, probably the only beautiful day that we're playing yeah. in this weekend. Um, and we might even do a double header. So whenever we're done with the day, home run derby will begin. Well, as long as I can, pro you can promise that uh, no one will be videoing me swinging the bat. <laughs> I'm, I'm open to possibly coming I mean, out and taking. I can't guarantee swing. it, but it doesn't matter. It's fine. It's a good yeah. cause, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see how that would go on Twitter, but obviously, you know, Coach Freeman. Uh, and and one thing I've noticed too, Coach, is which I love is you're seeing. I believe maybe I'm just noticing it more because of social media. But so much more inner squad support within the different sports programs. You saw the football team at the lacrosse game. We see the women's basketball team will show up for football games, for different events. Uh, how does that impact your team when you see oh, things like that? You see that it's sport? real. And let me tell you, it's it's funny because we finished our game last night and our whole team headed over to baseball. We sat out in the right field um, bleachers until they were done. And it's just, it's real. Um, and we were our athletic department is so supportive of each other and our students are really supportive of our student athletes. Um, and, and we see that, like you said, even lacrosse game, and that was awesome. Like that better, you know, we wanted it to be a different outcome, but it was an awesome to see um, the football team out there doing their thing. Um, but it is a huge, it's, it, it's real. And I think that, be, like you said, they all want to support each other because they all understand what they're all going through. And um, I know we have an extra table of trivia for all the student athletes who are going to come help us there. Um, so we're, you know, we, it, it's just, it's a big family um, and we take care of each other. Now you, you mentioned earlier, Coach, about the, the some of the details, the things that you really get into. I, I would love to hear about some of the specific ways in which this fundraiser and, and the different things you can can go to specifically. You kind of hinted on it a little bit, but I'd love to I'd love to know because I know a lot of people say, hey, I want to know what exactly okay, great strikeout cancer. That's an awesome cause, but what right. specifically 
is this going towards? Right. Well, we partner with the Samantha Hickey Foundation. Um, and we did that because we are friends with the Hickey family who lost their daughter um, to leukemia. Um, and through their foundation, we can spend the money how we want working with the hospital. So we have um, every Christmas we buy presents for every child in treatment and we go shopping um, and we we get a Christmas list and we go shopping and um, get them a, an awesome Christmas. That's number one. Number two, um, we have spent tens of thousands of dollars in the food pantry um, because a lot of people don't realize that I think it's almost 50 percent of the families who are whose children are being treated for cancer are food in, have food insecurities. Um, so they can go, their children can go get treatment and they can go shopping literally um, without money, take their grocery bags and fill up anything they need. Like no, no requirements. Um, they can get anything they want. Um, we have, we get gas cards for families who have to go get treatment um, outside of South Bend. We do hotel rooms. Um, we make sure all the kids are ready to um, go to school when they get to go to school. When they're done with treatment, we, we supply them with all their school supplies. Um, we send kids to camp for kids. Um, there's camps for kids who are under treatment, um, and we send kids to camp. We also have done wish trips um, for the age of group, the group of kids who are the 18 to 22 year olds who are still under pediatric treatment, but are too old for wish trips through Make-A-Wish. We sponsor those wish trips for those older kids. Uh, we also, boy, we've purchased a therapy dog for one of the boys who had a brain tumor. Um, to make to help him his days. So we just do whatever it takes. Uh, and that's what all the money goes to. You know, it, it's interesting, you know, you see a lot of fundraiser, fundraisers and different pushes for finances says, hey, we're going to we're going to fight we're gonna get cancer research. And that's obviously important. You know, the gym, what they do at ESPN with the Jim, uh, Jim Valvano Foundation is tremendous, right. obviously, right, because we need to try to find a cure for this. I love the idea, though, that, hey, that's not the only thing we need to be doing. There's families that are going through this now that that research may save a child down the road, but it's not going to save mine because it's not there yet. And being able to provide that community support was was I'll ask this coach was you was what you went through, obviously, with your child. Did that kind of give you an extra passion for maybe wanting to 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 help on the side of the families as opposed to, hey, let's raise money for you know, for cancer research, which is a tremendous cause as well. It's not to, to dismiss that, but to, to say, look, the families are going through things that people don't realize. It's not just the child who's going through a traumatic experience, but we need to support the families who then need to support the children as well. Yes. And going through it with Tatum, uh, it a hundred percent, I knew exactly how I wanted to help um, because I saw how, how she was helped. And it, you know, when you're talking, you know, she was in treatment, when she was four to six years old. So two and a half years, um, she was in treatment. And during those two and a half years, um, you know, you, you're afraid to even leave the house. Um, but when all of a sudden, you know, you go to treatment and she's met with a little Build-A-Bear, you know, that just brightens her day. And she, you know, she was given an iPad, which that changes your life, a four-year-old, let me tell you, who can't leave the house. Um, so those little things, and I didn't, it didn't dawn on me, you know, at the time that, you know, these, but they help so much. Um, and I knew when we were done with it, I was like, this is what I, this is how we can help. I know I can't cure it, but I know I can help these families. And I know the stressors that are happening with these parents um, who are just trying to get through the day and trying to get their child to take their medication and try to get their child to reduce that fever or, and, you know, try to get that child to be able to handle the treatment that they're given. I know how hard that is day in and day out. Um, and I want to be able to help with that. And obviously your, your daughter, I watching the video that we're going to play after, after you're gone, which is just a, a very heartwarming video. I always like trying to get, you know, grown men to cry. So I think that <laughs> video might help uh, a little bit, although I may have to take myself off screen. Uh, that's why I watched it beforehand. I was like, okay, let me get this out of the way now. Uh, you know, because when I was a, in middle school, one of my, my sister, I think she's in the first second grade, one of her friends pass away. Uh, I'll never, I'll never forget that just mm -hmm. kind of watching what that family went through. Uh, so when we have a chance to support a cause like this, I definitely want to do so, but your daughter obviously is around your players and the impact that their support had on her is, I mean, I got, I have to imagine when families see a, a place like Notre Dame and these athletes that are you know, some of the best in the nation to do what they do, 
that care, I, I think that also has to help. I mean, it's one thing to get financial support and, and other support, but to know that there's people out there that care about you, I have to think that that's something that's going to have a big impact as well. And you experienced that firsthand as well. Oh yeah. And it's, I think the thing that people don't realize um, until you're in it, you don't understand how wonderful people are. You know, we, we tend to hear and see the worst of people um, in media and, you know, just out there. But when you're, when you're in a really, really bad situation, that's when you see the best of people. And we have so many people here at Notre Dame who are the best of the best. And I'm not talking just in their sport or academics. I'm talking, these are, these are just phenomenal people who want to do the right thing all the time. And, um, you know, they're, they're on my team, you know, they, they want to help any way they can. And our athletic department, um, they work with um, Beacon and the Children's Hospital, and we do a Fighting Irish Fight for Life where kids are matched up with our teams. Um, and they spend time and, and get to know these kids and, and make a difference. And th these are the people that are, you know, how great is it that we get to be around all these people who are going to be running the world um, soon? So and if we can make one little bit of a difference while they're here, they get it. Like these, these kids, they get it. And they know how important it is. Forgot to unmute myself there for a second, there, Coach. Sorry about that. Uh, I tend to do that at least once a show, so 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 not an abnormal thing. Uh, we we actually have a signal that we do when I have one of our co-hosts on when someone's talking and and you see their lips moving with no sounds coming. We we do this like, hey, you're you're muted. So uh, we forgot to prep you for that. Uh, I should have warned you. Hey, Coach, if you see me talking with no sounds coming out, give me the signal. Uh, <laughs> I gotta oh, fix I gotcha. it. Um, uh, but when you when you talk about coach, obviously I, I'm a former college football coach, and I understand how important it is for your team to be just really have faith in each other and trust in each other. Do things like this help? I mean, we obviously practice matters and getting in the cage and all those type of things. But do things like this and going through experiences like this and these and, and, and the young ladies that you coach being able to get out in the community and see like, wow, you know, we've 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 got it, you know. College athletes go through their own issues as well, but yeah. is it something that you feel or have you experienced, Coach, that kind of brings your team together, that makes you all stronger, that then obviously that camaraderie, that unity then will manifest itself in, in the product that you're putting on the field as well? Without a doubt. And I think these kind of events bring people together. Um, but I'm a big believer in culture is everything and love and trust is everything. And the more you love and trust each other off the field, the more you're going to love and trust each other on the field. And this is just part of it. And, you know, you get to, it's so much nicer to get to know the, the person um, outside of what happens, you know, in the lines, um, because the life is so much more than just that. I always say softball is a mirror to real life um, and how you handle things on the field is typically how you handle things off the field. And I think it's vice versa. And I, you know, when you're, when you have, you know, a bunch of good people doing a lot of good around this world. It usually, um, it, it just manifests itself right onto the field. So speaking of, of on the field coach, I know we wanted to get a chance to talk a little about your current team and yeah. you guys had a great run last year, went 40 and 15, went to the NCAA tournament again, and you lost some, some big time players. Like yeah. I know, I think Abby sweet, I, I pronounce her name. It's Abby sweet. Yes. Correct. I know she was your center fielder. It's a heck of a player. You lost her, some other players, uh, and you know, your, your team is bouncing back obviously, and, um, started off, had a, a little early, early losing streak, but you, your team is really coming into form. You're coming off of a very convincing, I would say 50 to nothing victory, uh, against IUP, uh, UI this past weekend. So how is your team come along coach? Where are you guys at as you get ready to really start? I mean, I think four and four in ACC play, really start to ramp up ACC play now. Oh yeah. Here uh, we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, this is a team that. I think, you know, you're right. Like we, we had a tough time early and I do think it is, you know, softball is a funny game. You got to figure out how to get consistent. Um, and we play so many games that to be able to show up every day and bring that consistency every day is the toughest thing for a softball team to do. And I think we're figuring that out. And that's, that's my goal is like, we're really good. When we're good, we are really good. So how do we get that every single day? Um, because we have a lot of talent on this team and I feel like we just keep getting a little bit better, which that's what we want to do uh, throughout the year. We don't want to peak too early, as people say sometimes. But I, I think that this is a, a really good team who cares um, a lot about each other and a lot about this program. And as long as 
those are intact, that's intact, then we have a, a really good shot of doing big things down the road. Uh, so I noticed you. I know you have six seniors on your team, so obviously some some players are very important, but you have a lot that are slated to kind of come back next year. You've done this a lot, Coach. You lose players all the time. Like I said, 22 years, and you've had 21 NCAA tournament appearances, with COVID being the only exception. What what are the tricks that you've kind of found on, on being able to kind of year after year replacing good players and building that team? What are the challenges and what are the things that you've learned over the years – in regard to how to build, because it's not like just one formula every year. This is the this is the tried and true, and as long as we do this, it's going to work. Because then everybody would do it. I was going to say, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, no, <laughs> right. yeah I would love that. Well, um, what are some of the challenges and what are the, some of the things that you've done just overall, and then that you've done with this team to kind of, like you said, to get them to the level where they are playing with that consistency? We've got the talent, ladies. That's why we brought you here. That's why we recruited you here. Let's get to our potential. What are some things you've done just general and with this specific team that have started to work? Well, I think we have to talk about it a lot and talk about expectations and talk about, um, you know, where we are and, and honesty. I think that's so, so important for a team is where are we now? Where do we want to be and how do we get there? Um, and I and those are, those are the things I ask myself all the time. And I ask the team because I think what they think really matters. And I think that's the one thing that I'm sure of. I have to trust them to know what they need as well. Um, and the more I try to just do it myself, that usually backfires. I think the older I'm getting, the more I'm being able to like, okay, guys, what you tell me, like, what do we need to get there? Mm -hmm. And they know, I mean, they're, like I said, they're a smart group of girls and they're pretty fantastic. So they're really good at working with me on figuring out how, how we're going to get there. And I think that's a big part of it is believe in the team that you have. And, and that's what I, I try to do all the time is, you know, listen to them, believe in them and help them believe in themselves because we are pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. So ownership, really just getting them to understand, yeah. that, hey, this at the end of the day, I can coach you, I can do this, I can call this play, but at the end of the day, it's about execution. You guys mm -hmm. have to go out there and get it done. And so let's let's work on this together. And obviously it's worked, coach. I mean, you know, it's 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 got a nice streak going as you as you look at your team uh, moving forward, coach, do you do you do you kind of you start getting excited about what this team is kind of hitting their stretch? Do you feel like they're starting to peak? Do you feel like that part's there? Are they there or are they are they close? Where are you guys as as ACC play start? Because we as we said, you guys have uh, you've got Pitt coming up, and then you've got Louisville coming up. You still have a series against Virginia Tech, Boston College, Florida State. A lot coming up still before the NCAA tournament. Uh, yeah, began, well, I mean, so. we're not even halfway done yet, which is yeah, crazy. Right, and we've right. been at it for a long time, but <laughs> I think we're getting there. And I like that the fact that we're still getting there um, because there's always room for improvement. Um, and we do have we have the most important part of our season ahead of us. Um, and we and we get to control that. So I, it's pretty awesome. Like we're in a good place. Um, we get to choose how we play. You know, we, our, the opponent gets to choose how they play, but we get to choose how we play. Um, and I think we're in a good position to know what works and what doesn't. And so I'm pretty darn excited about, you know, where we're going. And we have a, some great competition ahead of us to put us in a really good place. Yeah, I, I know it's just like the ACC seems to be very strong this year. Yes. Uh, so very, very loaded conference. So your team is getting ready to hit the – the meat and potatoes of, of that come, coming up here, Coach. So there I know we that, go, and I love it. Yeah, it's got to get exciting. I know I said mention Louisville, Florida State, and Virginia Tech series coming up. They currently rank second, third, and fourth in the ACC. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, your, your team's got a challenge. I look forward to, to following how that goes. Coach, I just want to bring up, before we get you out of here, I just want to bring up some of the super chats we've gotten that are specific to to what we're doing here, if you're, you're okay with that. And there was one particular question I was hoping – uh, that you'd be able to address from one of our from one of our loyal listeners. Obviously, Tom Connor sent us a super chat. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have a big super chat here from Irish Eagle ninety. Thank you very 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 much for that. Uh, awesome. Fat Jack thirty three says lost my dad to cancer. Thank you for helping the community. Uh, DJ says love you, Coach Gump. So uh, little pet peeve of mine. He did not capitalize C. I, it's one of my biggest pet peeves, and I don't know if it's grammatically correct, but I'm like, you don't know, lowercase when you say like president, whoever. The P is capitalized. Coach is a title, so uh, let's capitalize those bad boys. That's Gum awesome. Gumbo and Bodane with a super chat. Thank you very very much. Uh, Bobby St. Thomas says, let's strike out cancer, then hit a home run. Hopefully we'll see some of those this weekend, coach. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And the, here, here's one of the questions from that we had, coach, is this is from Father David Penny, who is a, a, a priest in, in Canada. One of our loyal listeners says, lost my mom to cancer in my early 20s. Thank you for this. Coach Gump, as a father of two young girls, 
What advice do you have to encourage my girls and their love of sports and softball in particular? That's a great question, um, especially from a from a dad who probably wants to correct everything they're doing all the time <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a mom and I feel the same way. Um, I can tell you um, from my experience and as a parent and as a coach, just tell them how much you love watching them play. I think that's the most important thing that we forget to do sometimes um, because I know, you know, like I said, as a coach and a parent, I'm super critical of everything. You know, I'm, I want them to be do everything right all the time, right? Like good fundamentals all the time. Um, but sometimes it's just sit back and then just enjoy watching your kids do something that they enjoy and just be so supportive of the fact that they love it. And when they want to go practice, go practice with them. Mm -hmm. When they don't want to go practice, don't make them. Yeah. Uh, because it has to come from within them, and that's how they become great. I wish you would have been able to talk to my dad about that when we were young. <laughs> my dad, I'm I'm three years older than my sister. She was a very good softball player. She actually got recruited to, to pitch at Radford. Nice. Uh, she was a very, very good softball player uh, when she was young. And her two daughters, I've told you before the show, Layla, my nieces, Layla and Allie, are both very good softball players. I've gotten a chance to see them both play this past year. And some of them. So what I do is when I go, when we play, when Notre Dame plays Virginia Tech or Duke or whatever, I'll fly into Virginia Beach, see my family, and then drive to the game. So I get a chance to see my girls uh, uh, play. But my dad would talk to my sister the same way he did me, which mm -hmm. worked for me because I, I wanted that. But my sister just wanted her, my dad to say, hey, Great job. Love you. Mm -hmm. And and be there when she wanted to go hit, when she wanted yeah. to go play. So I I, I think that. Get out. Yeah. But I can tell you at the end of the day, you just want your parents' support. Mm -hmm. You know, but you want to make them proud. That's what I'm sure of. Yeah. So it, basically the advice is if your child wants to be coached and be pushed, you'll know it. Mm -hmm. And but you're still you're still listening though. You're you're taking that cue from them and say, Dad, you know, Dad, I want you to go push me. I want you to take me out and hit me a thousand ground balls and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. So I love to hear it. Thanks coach. Uh, we have a couple more from Charlie Weiss's last, last belt loop coach Gump. I personally only follow Notre Dame football. We got to change that Charlie, yeah. uh, but I want to say thank you for what you do. I think it's incredible how you want to give back. Thank you. We have a super chat here from Jimmy uh, James. Way to go, IB. Keep up the great work, causes and people. Here we go from Full House Backfield Coach. Another big super chat. Thanks, Coach. And thanks, Coach and BD, uh, for raising awareness and funds for a great cause. And thanks to the Notre Dame IB community for coming together to support it. Makes me proud to be an alum and small part of it. We're not done yet, folks. There's still, uh, I think the, the goal is 40,000. We are, you guys just passed 30,000 today. So, we got to keep rocking and rolling, people. We are not there. There was just a thousand dollar donation just went in that pushed you over thirty thousand during the show. I don't know if that's from some here or not. It was anonymous. So you guys have now passed thirty thousand during the show, Coach, which is great. Awesome. And, and of course, so we got to keep going, everybody. We got through the weekend, so we we got to get them to that goal. It's always good to go past it, everybody. So we oh, we will. We'll go past. We're, we're, we're sure. ready to rock and roll. So let's <laughs> definitely do our part. Absolutely. And then from John DeCrisio, another big super chat. Thank you, John. This is another longtime listener. I uh, lost my dad, mom, and brother all to cancer. Happy to help out. So, John, I appreciate that uh, that very very much. So, Coach, uh, and, and Father David said thank you, Coach, for that advice. So, I appreciate that. So, Coach, we're getting kind of close to that time where I know you got to go, although, you know, your game got canceled today. I feel like God was like, hey, look, Coach, I need you to relax. And, you know, we got this interview with Irish Breakdown. It's, you know, way, I'll take care of the game. Don't worry. You <laughs> know, so. Just let it snow a little. Yeah. <laughs> my wife is, my wife loves snow. She, it's funny. She grew up in San Diego. I don't know why she loves snow so much, but. Uh, so whenever she sees snow, she gets all excited and goes and lights a fire. So I just uh, alerted her to the fact it's snowing. So she's now in a great mood. She's going to go light a fire and hang out in the fireplace room. So she's in a good mood. But I yeah. personally am not a big fan. And I know you, you would much rather it not snow. Although I'd rather it snow than rain. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Although in, nor in, nor in northern Indiana, it's a, in March, it can be a little bit of a challenge. So. And this is why I tell the recruits, you don't come for the weather, you come because it's Notre Dame. Right. That's right. That's right. And, win, and to win, obviously, right. that's been a big part of it. Another big deal. super chat from, from Ryan Randolph. Ryan, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Coach, just some things you want to wrap up with. Obviously, I would love to, if we can start converting some people into not just being Notre Dame football fans, but some some people into uh, to also the Notre Dame softball fans. Because, obviously, if you're someone who loves Notre Dame football because of its tradition of excellence, then you absolutely need to be supporting the Notre Dame softball team because of your tradition of excellence, obviously, and that consistency. What's your, uh, you know, what, what would you like to say to the folks as we wrap up here, Coach, and, and before we get ready to play the, the video? Well, I just want to say thank you. Um, and um, 
for you, Brian, to do this is awesome to help our cause. Um, I'm very, very proud of our team and our program, and we we want to make a difference. We're going to be great on the softball field. That's a given, and we're pretty fun to watch play also. Yes. But yes. we're also going to make a big difference, and I want to thank you for helping us make a big difference here. Well, I actually have watched your team play uh, you know, with some of the live games, and you know, I, I'm a big fan because I grew up watching my sister play softball, yeah. and it was always like everything was like a bun or hit and run, and it just I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you guys play really. I mean, you'll do that. That's a big part of the strategy, but you have some bombers on yeah, your team do. too. So I'm like, dang, I was watching <laughs> a, one of the home runs you hit against IUP. I was like, that is a stroke right there. She took a, it looked like a fastball right at her knees and just raked it. I was oh, like, yeah. okay, this is this is good softball. Uh, and you. you guys play really good defense as well, which is something I enjoy to watch as well. Yeah. So, so it matters. We know that. Yeah. Yes, but it, it, I'm serious, folks. I'm not just saying this as coaches on. I'm being serious. I think everybody knows me that I, I tell you how it is. You are a fun team to watch. I start and I and I started watching you guys last year uh, because I, your social media team does a pretty good job of getting clips and updates and different things out. And I started to kind of follow it that way. And boy, this is this is a fun team to watch. This is a really good brand of softball that I that I that I enjoy to watch. And I truly mean that. So you know, in a lot of your games are televised. Or what people need to know is if you go to the Notre Dame schedule, they'll have links to where you can watch it. And, and watch the game. So it's not just about if you if you're in town and you can get to over to Melissa Cook Stadium, that's great. But you can also watch online and support right. the team online. You'll I think every single game is on um, yeah. is online at least yes. or on television. Yes. So d- definitely support the team. And if you're someone who likes baseball, likes softball, likes that that brand of ball, you will enjoy watching this team play. And it, like I said, I looked at your roster, coach. You have a uh, pretty young team. A lot of <laughs> freshmen, a lot of sophomores, you know, and only six seniors. So uh, you're going to get to know these young ladies over the next couple of years. I, I know we've started to see, I don't know if this is a new thing, but I'm starting to see more on Twitter of commitments and things like that. So that's really good to see and uh, looking oh, forward yeah. to, to, to watching your team continue to develop and do what you do every year, coach, which is win. So, Thank you. Thanks yeah. so much. Well, coach, thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate you. And we are uh, so thankful that you are willing to come and be a part of uh, part of what we're doing here today and that we could in our small little way help you as much as we can. I can't thank you enough. You, Like I said, you're making a difference and I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks coach. Hey, have a great day. And I hope to see a lot of uh, folks out there this weekend. So last thing before we go, coach, just remind people of uh, this weekend and all the festivities and how that's going to tie into what you guys are doing with this cause. Yes, 6 p.m. Friday, 1 p.m. on Saturday. Sunday is also 1 p.m. And right after that is our Home Run Derby. Okay, excellent. Home run. And, and I think she said for those who got in uh, late that we that she a little birdie told her that Coach Freeman is going to be out there participating in the Home Run Derby, correct? Now, he doesn't get a freebie, right, Coach? He still has to give the $10. Oh, right? I think he better give more than 10 Okay. <laughs> and just so you know, um, the link to donate is also on our Twitter. Okay, excellent. So it's on your Twitter page. It's in the description box below of this show. If you are listening right now, we're live. If you're listening later when this show is over, it, we, if you leave a super thanks, that is the same as a super chat. That will also be counted towards what we're going to do. Coach, we did have one quick question popped up here on a super chat, if you don't mind answering. It's Josh Miller says, my parents were slow pitch softball coaches. Did you start out in slow pitch? Oh, that, that's actually a really interesting question because it took a long time for women to start playing fast pitch. Um, but women started playing fast pitch in the 70s. So um, I, my dad uh, played after he had his college career in baseball, he started playing on a men's fast pitch softball team. So when I was five years old, I was introduced to fast pitch softball. So I have played it my entire life um, since I was I started swinging the bat when I was six. Oh, wow. OK, there. You, and now. So your dad was a base college baseball player mm-hmm. and so was your husband, I believe. Correct. Yes. So baseball, softball, that's clearly, clearly in your DNA, coach. Kind of in the blood. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, Coach, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, I hope that we can uh, hope you guys continue to to do what you do, rocking and rolling, and good luck this weekend against Pitt. And thank you so much for being on our show with thank us. Thank you, Brian. Much appreciated. Yes, ma'am. All right. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to bring in Ryan Roberts. What we're going to do now is I want to play this video. Notre Dame did a great video a few years back uh, of Coach Gump, where uh, they they kind of, it was like early when they were going through this when her daughter got got sick. And so I want to 
I want to bring that up and allow people to watch that. It was, it was just a tremendous, tremendous video. And I need to find the tab here real quick. So just give me a second here, folks. All right. It is a Twitter tab. All right, here we go. So we're going to watch this and uh, make sure everyone that you can hear it. So just let me know if you if that you guys can hear it when we get this thing rocking and rolling. Just give me a second. All right. Okay, here we go. I'm going to pull it up in YouTube. It'll be a little easier to see on YouTube. So just give me a second. We'll get this up and we will be ready to rock and roll. All right. So just make sure, like I said, folks, if you could let me know that you can hear this when we get it going, I would greatly appreciate it. Tatum's like our little sister. She is a ball of fun. She is just always bouncing around, you know, always talking to us. And before everything had happened, I realized, you know, Tatum's so much fun. And the greatest part was that she she stayed pretty much the same after, you know, she was always out there trying to have fun and trying to hang out with us. And, you know, it, it's just really cool to have that kind of relationship. In the summer of 2010, Deanna Gumpf, head coach of Notre Dame's softball team, was thrown the biggest curveball of her life. Her four-year-old daughter, Tatum, was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The day was kind of crazy. I remember, um, it's like yesterday. Uh, I'd I kept Tatum with me because I, know, I knew she was a little bit off and she'd kind of had that fever on and off. And she woke up and, that morning and it looked like she had dried chocolate on her lips. And I was like, that is so, what, what, what were you doing last night, Tatum? She's like, nothing. I said, did you eat something? And she said, no. And I wiped it off with a tissue um, and got a washcloth and wiped it some more. And then I brushed her teeth. And when I brushed her teeth, her gums were just bleeding like crazy. Um, and I thought, whoa, this is just weird. I called her doctor, her pediatrician, and I said, something's funny. Her gums are bleeding when I brush her teeth and she woke up with blood on her mouth. And the, her pediatrician said, bring her in right away. And so, we brought her in and she just took a, a blood test and then we left. And then I went back to the office. She comes back about maybe an hour, hour and a half later and she has Tatum with her. And I remember this vividly. They brought in sushi and they were going to eat lunch. And literally we were just in there, you know, I was joking around with Tatum and um, got her sushi all set up and Deanna's phone rings. Well, Deanna stepped out, went into Lizzie's office because Lizzie was out of town and takes the phone call. And I can just hear like, you, you just got that feeling that there was something wrong. And she said, there's something wrong with Tatum. And I said, what? And she said, okay, it's one of two things and neither are good. And I said, okay. And she said, um, no matter what, you need to get down. You need to go to Memorial Hospital. You need to get her blood drawn again. And then you, from there, you're probably going to be going to Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. And I said, okay, well, what are these two things? Because I'm like, I need to know what's going on. And she said, well, it's either leukemia or aplastic anemia. The doctor told Deanna to bring Tatum in right away. We need to do blood work. Um, and after the results came, uh, Deanna actually couldn't get a hold of me because I was in the chapel, just praying for help. Went over to Memorial, met my husband over there, and my sister drove me because I was kind of a mess. and. Um, he took the blood test again, and literally within 15 minutes, he said, okay, um, we think she has leukemia. You need to go down to Riley. And uh, I don't remember that drive at all. A lot of things going through my head, you know, a lot of prayers. It was the worst feeling I'd ever felt in my life. When we got to Riley, it was close, it was a life and death situation um, because she had nothing to help her survive. Um, and I think that's why the transfusions happened so quickly uh, because she had, she, was, she had nothing to fight anything off with. She had no immune system and she had hardly any hemoglobin left. Um, so it was, it was very critical at that moment. Deanna and I both were, we like to, we wanna figure it out and let's do what we gotta do to get this fixed. I think 
Deanna absorbed more of it. She probably got a master's in leukemia in about two days. And, and while she was absorbing most of it, I was trying to stay with Tatum and just kind of keep her away from hearing certain things or just, you know, keep her busy. With Deanna being a coach, it definitely helped her with the plan of attack for getting all the resources together. She had this huge binder of information that she used for reference whenever something would come up. I think that's similar to her coaching plan where she's got all of her information around her. Being a coach, or if it's just me, or being a coach or what that is, it's absolutely how I do things. I need to know what it is. I need to know how to handle it. And I need to kind of make a plan of attack of how we're going to deal with it. Once I knew what we were dealing with and what, you know, acute lymphoblastic leukemia was, okay, so what do we need to do? I need to know the, the best scenario, the worst scenario and everything in between. And then we just go. Uh, and that's kind of how we've been handling it over the last two and a half years. When Notre Dame's strong of heart continues, Tatum's recovery gains momentum with support from the Notre Dame community. Once past the initial shock of Tatum's diagnosis, Deanna realizes she and her family won't have to face this life-threatening disease alone. The Notre Dame family reached out immediately and didn't stop. Truly, I don't think I could have handled it anywhere else. I believe, you know, things happen for weird reasons and I'm so thankful that I work at Notre Dame when my daughter was diagnosed with cancer. I can't imagine being somewhere else and not having the community that we have here. I can't remember a day that didn't go by that I didn't receive a message from somebody from Notre Dame uh, for like the first month and a half. Just, are you okay? You know, what do you need? Tell us what you need. Everyone kept saying, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? And all I needed was my daughter to get better. We are all just so close here. I mean, I think that we just know each other and we just, uh, you know, we can rely on each other, we're hard on each other, we're honest with each other. And, um, you know, these guys are here for me day in and day out. And, you know, they're, I'm here for them as well. They just crush these kids the first 28 days after they're diagnosed. And then depending on how they handle that first 28 days, they go one direction or the other. And she did great. I saw her physically getting better about three months later. She got some energy back and started dancing around again and becoming her again. Um, so like when I was at um, Riley, everyone was coming in surprising me with balloons and then they were all saying, um, I've been praying for you and I hope you get done pretty soon. The way that they, they beat the leukemic cells is they just crush their, their immune system so they don't, nothing grows. Uh, and so I didn't let her out of the house very often. I kind of kept her in our little bubble world. She came out for her leukemia game. We had a special game for kids with cancer. The first strikeout cancer day was so emotional um, because it was one of the first times, first of all, that Tatum had left the house in months. And just seeing her out there, and she was so excited to be out there, and you were just so happy for her. Um, but at the same time, you know, she she was you know she was in uniform, but you know she didn't have her hair at that point. You know, you still knew it was still kind of a, a smack in the face a little that this kid was battling. She loved the attention. She had a great time out there, and I think the funniest thing was she would go into the stands and and sell her autograph so she could <laughs> donate that money to Memorial also. So she she got up there and she said, do you want my autograph? Do you want my autograph? It's only 50 cents. She actually made about $35. <laughs> I, I remember putting a uniform on her that morning. It was, it was great. And just bringing her out here to be a part of it. But to see her run out, run around and stretch with the girls um, and then throw out the first pitch was was awesome. When we walked out there together, I was just a mess. Uh, and I just to watch her, to see her throw that out when there was a time where I didn't think I'd have her. It was pretty awesome. We had a huge 
party when she was done with treatment in September. Uh, so she finished her last treatment and two weeks later we had a bash, the biggest party I've ever had. Um, and all of our friends and family were there. It was just a big, huge orange party. Uh, and it was a blast. And then two months later, she was able to get her port out and that it was, a, it was a very scary day because to, to, to think that she's getting her port out, um, and it's really over is scary to me. It's almost too good to be true. So I have a hard time thinking that it's really done. I think we're winning innings. You know, I, I there's a timeline, I, I think within five years or whatever, certain years. I don't know if even after that timeline, will I say we won the game, but we're definitely winning innings. And I see us winning a lot more innings. Coach never gives up. And once coach has a goal on her mind or um, something that she wants to strive for, she will do everything in her power to see that uh, that goal is reached. I think with Tatum, um, it's a perfect example of that. She wanted to do everything possible for her daughter, and um, I believe she did. I think more than anything I've learned, no matter what I'm going through, you know, it's not the worst of the worst. You can, you can make it. And I think her positive attitude through everything was really what helped her fight and what I've definitely learned from in that whole situation. Notre Dame is a family. And when you're part of it, you totally understand that. Uh, and I think you feel that the most when things are hard. Because I think the people make Notre Dame, Notre Dame. And uh, you're never alone. All right. So that is the story. So I, I, I wanted to play that to give you all a little bit of background about just specifically why this matters so much to Coach Gump. Like, obviously, she would be supporting this cause no matter what, but it gets to be personal when you go through something like that. I believe her daughter, that was from age, that was from like 2010 to 12 is when she went through that. She is now, I think, 17 or 18 now. And so she obviously came through it. So it's a really, uh, it's a it's a great story. And there are families who doesn't turn out as well as it did for Tatum. And either way, this is a great cause because, I, as I said during the show, the thing that I like about this is it's great to raise money for cancer research. I would love it if we could kick cancer and find out ways to cure it and turn it into any other normal thing that we're okay with, with just a surgery or medicine or whatever the case may be. But we're not there yet. But, you know, and, and I'm not even a parent, but I lost a dog to cancer. I can only imagine what it would be like to have a child go through it and to, to be part of an organization that's helping to raise money to be there for those families, for those children, to get them what they need. Coach mentioned that they got a, a therapy dog for one of the boys that, was, that had a brain tumor. You know, I just think it's just such an amazing thing. And, you know, we look at these student athletes and we see them as athletes. You know, we see them putting on the uniform and Notre Dame and represent Notre Dame. But they're young people with a chance to make a difference in the world. And one of the things I love about the University of Notre Dame is how, and I'm not saying they're the only one, but I cover Notre Dame, is, is the pride that so many of these young people take in being able to make an impact in their community. And to see the softball team do what they're doing, I just think is amazing. And we wanted to support it. I know this is a football channel, but some things are bigger than football. And yeah. that's what we wanted to do today. And so we would love a lot of people have already given, as, as I said, that the, they've raised a lot of money since our show started. We are already around $500 in super chats already. So uh, we've got right now about $465 from what I can tell in American dollars and then about 45 from our Canadian friends. I'm not sure what the translation to that is, you know, the American dollar, but we're getting close to, or if we haven't already passed $500. And so we're going to move on to the mailbag next, but I just reminded you all that if you have not donated and you'd like to, that there's a link in the description box below of this. If you are someone who watches the show after it's live, it's okay. You can still give. Uh, you can, if you want to give, obviously the best way to give in, in, if, if the show's over, the best way, honestly, to give is just to go directly to the, the link below. If for some reason you want to put a super thanks in there because you want to leave a comment here, that's great too. We'll give the cut. We'll, we'll put the cut of that, um, you know, and, and, and give that as well. That'll be part of what we give, but, uh, we're doing the super chat thing to kind of make the mailbag fun to kind of raise money so we can kind of give something on behalf of Irish breakdown 
And so uh, that's why we're doing it today. So any 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 amount you give for if it's a dollar ninety nine, if it's two dollars, if it's a hundred dollars, whatever is so we're when we answer questions, we're going to answer those questions. If you gave us a, 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 an amount that and you didn't a- ask a question and you want to ask a question, we will ask that we will answer that question from those people that did that. So you don't have to give another super chat unless you just want to because you want to continue helping the cause. So I just wanted to uh, point that out as well. So we're going to move on to the mailbag next. But before we do, folks, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell and share this podcast. So we're going to dive into this special mailbag we're doing, Ryan. And again, today we're going to be addressing the super chat questions that we have from folks. And so uh, right now, today is only super chat. Some of the questions we're going to bring up are not going to have super chats attached to them. But it's basically from people that gave a super chat that didn't ask a question with that super chat, but we still want to honor their question. So, you know, for example, Charlie Weiss's last belt loop asked a question that wasn't attached to a super chat, but then he gave a super chat, basically encouraging Coach Gump. We'll, so we'll answer one of his questions as well. So that's what today's mailbag is going to be about. And as I said before, every single penny that we get from Google. Uh, in regard to the super chats, we are going to donate on behalf of Irish Breakdown uh, to to this fundraiser because it does go through the weekend. So we'll have time to have it processed. So I'm very excited to be a part of that and to be able to help that. So you will see over the next couple of days, whenever the amount is processed, you'll see a on the because it says everyone that's donated. I've already given personally. It, then I'll give one on behalf of of everyone at Irish Breakdown as well. So we'll have that also. So I'm looking forward to that. So that's why we are doing super chats only today. Uh, folks, I definitely want to make sure that you guys understand that. And to everybody that we kind of pulled up during the show, Full House Backfield, John DeCrisio, Ryan Randolph, uh, getting up here, uh, go through all these, Tom Connor, uh, Irish Eagle 90, Fat Jack 33, DJ uh, Gumbo in Boudain, Bobby St. Thomas, Father Penny, uh, all of you, Charlie Weiss's Last Belt Loop, Jimmy James, uh, all of you that gave super chats that were just not even to ask a question, just to because you wanted to help. I appreciate y'all so very much. I knew this community would step up. They, you always do. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to that. Because we, Ryan, we've only been planning this for like 24 hours. It's wild. And we're already raised over $500 on top of what people have just given in response to it. So, uh, and, and so like we've raised about $500, but the softball team has already raised over $30,000, which is awesome. So they're getting close to meeting their goal of 40 and they haven't even got to the weekend series yet. So that is amazing. The Notre Dame community has helped up, has helped out once, stepped up and helped out once again. So just an amazing thing. But it's football time now, Ryan, and we're going to get some questions. All right. So you ready to you ready to rock and roll, Mr. Roberts? Let's do it, man. I'm trying to collect myself from that emotional state that that video well, put me you in. You know, Ryan, I think yeah. for you too, is like you are a father of a young girl. Yep. Jules isn't that far away from being the age that Tatum was when she went through that. So no. I think a lot of people can relate to that. I lost my dog Brady to cancer. And I remember how devastated my family was. And it's a dog. It's not even a child. So it's, uh, it, it's just a different feeling because Juliet is two now, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, Tatum was four. <laughs> like it's yeah. not far at all. And I mean, I, I think of even like when Jules just gets sick, right? Like when she has a cough or when she's throwing up, like you're terrified, you know, you're absolutely terrified, but that obviously isn't a potential for death, right? For like the fine, like the just, yeah, man, just the permanence of it is just so scary, man. It really is. So um, I'm glad to see that she's supporting this. And I'm really, I'm really glad that coach Gump is, she, believes in it this much, you yeah. know, and, and understands just how much it means to other people, not even just for herself, you know, cause she's the lucky yeah. one, right? She's one of the right. lucky ones that family got very through blessed. it, but yeah, yeah. very so, blessed and fortunate. No incredible, doubt. man. Absolutely incredible. All right. Let's, so let's get to this. And of course, you know who we're kicking it off with Ryan, you, yep. you, you, you know, what we're going with this to start with John a one super chat, John, thank you. As always, man, he said, is cover two still the most effective base coverage? Brian, I, I, so I actually saw this one before while you guys were, you know, while you were still interviewing coach and John, I wouldn't, this is my thought on like coverages, right? I want something pre-snap that can be the most effective to roll into different things. I think that that for me is when a coverage is most effective. It's a shell though. It's not the actual coverage, right? Like I'm not saying dropping the cover one, dropped two, drop three. 
What I'm saying is when you have a two high alignment, so that's two safeties on the hashes, you can do a lot of different things out of that. You can play two. You can play quarters. You can roll and play cover one. You can roll and play cover three. You can do a lot of things out of that alignment. So I like two high shells, but it doesn't necessarily mean I would say that cover two is the most effective base coverage. I think it's more about the alignment for me personally, and there's a preference. Because I mean, I've been on some teams where – we suck to cover three. Been on some teams where we suck to cover two. And so no team's the same. But I mean, obviously that does fit into what does your team do well, right? So I think that changes pretty consistently. But I am a big fan of disguise and coverages. I'm a big fan of if I set up in too high post pre-snap, there's a lot I can do out of that. If you line up with just a single high though and you're in a single high shell, there are some limitations to that. It's hard to get back into certain types of coverages, but when you're in a too high shell, it could be a lot of different variations, which I think is really effective, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you, I think you rightly s- differentiate between cover two and a two high shell. N- not many people really play cover two anymore. What we've seen, what we've seen, the, it, it evolve into it's more of a boundary coverage now, much more so than a a full field coverage the way it used to be, Ryan. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of reasons for it. Number one is with anything teams over time learn how to combat it like we, we were talking yesterday remember we were talking about like the 01 and 02 miami teams right they used to play two man a ton i mean I that was man, what man. they did they love played it. two man a ton and you're seeing teams are so able to have success now with that but because it gives you that five under man coverage ability where cover two to the field if you're running cover two to the field the way that passing games are nowadays you're putting that field safety in a really tough spot i mean a yeah. really tough spot and so you're you're seeing just cover two being more part of a combo. So teams are running a lot more two into the boundary, four to the field, and maybe two to the boundary, maybe man to the field. There's all there's pattern match stuff that will go with yes. it. And so you, you you just don't see a lot of pure cover two anymore. I think your point was spot on, Ryan, of cover two structure, yes. which is 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 really the way to go because you can roll your safety down field boundary. And then get another to get a guy in the box. You can start and cover two and and press your safeties up and then bail into a cover four. Uh, yep. You can go cover three out of it post snap. And it because because quarterbacks are taught this you're recognizing open versus closed center of the field. Yes. So you teach quarterbacks pre snap. One of the things you look at is the, is the middle of the field open or closed. So essentially, if there's one safety in the middle of the field, that's considered a closed. It's closed. The center of the field, the, the middle of the field is closed. If it's a too high structure, then it's a it's an open middle of the field, and your yep. read is going to reflect that. Well, if I'm my quarterback is reading four verts, for example, Ryan, and I'm going to read four verts versus cover two differently. I'm reading to a side. I'm reading the safety mm-hmm. to the side. If it's cover three and I'm running four verts, I'm running. I'm reading the two seams. Well, if I'm thinking I'm reading, you know the the you know the field side or the boundary side depending on where you know wherever it's going to be and all of a sudden they roll that sucker down and that field safety rolls back and all of a sudden I'm thinking this guy's going to be a hook curl guy but all of a sudden he gets up underneath that wheel route my my quarterback has got to make a really quick reaction and adjustment to that veteran quarterbacks can do that but it can create some mistakes and so that you see so much more of that but I'm with you Ryan I still believe a too high structure is a great way to base your defense. And here's the other thing, too. Some teams will do this. It's a little harder to do this, Ryan. But you'll see teams show a cover one structure and roll to two. Uh, yeah. You can do it a couple different ways. You can have like sort of like a true two to the boundary, but then it's almost like an invert to the field where actually the corner will buzz to sort of play that half field from an off coverage standpoint and the safety will run hook curl. And then the flat defender basically takes over the cornerback's responsibility. It doesn't look like cover two traditionally, but it's essentially accomplishing the same exact thing. I don't see that a ton anymore, but you'll see stuff like that as well. And I think that's where defenses have to go in order to, to match just the, the spread the field stuff from defense from offense. This is you've got to create confusion. You've got to create missed opportunities. And if you have the ability to go to play, this is why man coverage is coming back, Ryan. If you have the ability to play man coverage at the second level, 
that gives you a lot of different options to take away the quick game and some of those different things and put teams into a bind and allow your pass rush to have a bigger impact. So it's a great no question, doubt. John. I mean, that that's why you're now seeing a lot of former safeties become the linebacker position, mm-hmm. right? That overhang position, the big nickel. Like, you're seeing all that type of stuff, man. Like, I mean, even variations. I love that you mentioned kind of the combo coverages too, Brian. Like, I saw – Coach Brandt was talking about like cover six. I mean, for people that don't know, that's like that's cover three on the front side, cover two into the boundary, right? So like those different types of things are very that that's the one part of the game that I think is is still very evolutionary, right? Like we're still finding different ways to show that variation, right? Like there's barely any teams, especially in the NFL level specifically and even on college level they're just going to run a typical cover three right right? like barely anybody ever does that it's the pattern match stuff where you know depending on what a defender does it could it could uh the coverage could rotate between zone or man depending on kind of how what you're looking at from a from a pattern a lot from a pattern combination type of perspective that's why i mean coverages are so fascinating that's one of the greatest things that coaching taught me because I was a front seven guy, right? So like mm-hmm. I knew as a linebacker, like I need to get to my hook curl or my curl flat or whatever it ends up being, right? But I didn't understand until I was in coaching that like knowing what's happening in the back forward really opens up your mind to like why everything is working the way it does. Yeah. And yeah, coverages do that for you, man. It really does. Absolutely. All right, let's get to some more here. Question from Coach Brent, 574. Coach Thank ben. you for – Coach yeah. Benz, my yeah. apologies, my apologies. Thank All you for the good. super chat. It was great to finally meet BD and see Vince on Saturday. Bummed I didn't get to meet Sean Davis too. Today is another reason why we love IB. Yeah, it was great meeting you, Coach, and, was, and, I, and I appreciate the uh, the little info you told me from being able to see practice. But, uh, you know, obviously we didn't publish it because I don't want Coach to get in trouble and I don't want them to stop having coaches be there. But, uh, yeah, he got a chance to see the full practice on Saturday. That's and, awesome. And so, yeah, I was very jealous, very jealous, very jealous of you. Uh, Zach Martin brought this super chat up earlier. Zach, I'm so sorry that I missed this question that you had for Coach Gump. I really apologize. I saw it. I started. I saw Screw Cancer and Coach Gump, and I just kind of – there was a bunch of super chats in a row that were just encouragement, and I'm just sorry I missed this, man. And I just – as I went through it, I do apologize. Because I would have liked to have heard that story, to be completely <laughs> honest with you. Uh, I think that would have been a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, Coach was great. She answered questions. Uh, she she uh, It was really cool to, to be able to chat with her. I, I hope we are able to do that again uh, with them moving forward. So we had a super chat from Rob Osgood. It says, love the show. Love the boards. Best in the business. Appreciate you, Rob, very, very much. Rob, if you want to get a question in later, you can. Since you gave the super chat, I appreciate that. Uh, Same with you, Coach Bent. If you guys, since you guys gave super chats to support, but didn't ask questions, if you guys have questions later, we will we will get to those. Let's get down here to Jack Reacher's elbow. Ryan, have you seen this series on Amazon Prime? Have you watched I have it? Not. I, I nope. should have known the answer is going to be no. <laughs> it's <laughs> really <man>. good. <laughs> I didn't love the movie. Like, I didn't love the the movies were okay with Tom Cruise, but like my mom had poisoned my head on it because she had informed me like the real Jack Reacher in the book. Not yeah. the real Jack Reacher, but the character in the the novels is like a really big guy. And they had Tom Cruise play it. Well, in the series on Amazon Prime, I, I loved the first season, but it's a really big guy. I mean, he's huge. It's uh I forget the guy's name. So, Alan Richman, so, I think is no so so uh, five so five nine Tom Cruise didn't do it for you then? No, he didn't do it for me. No, I just <laughs> no, he didn't do it for me. But uh it was really good. It was really good. Nice. I enjoyed it. So Jack Reacher, and he he would hit people with elbows, like just knock people out with elbows. So there's a there's a prison scene where some guy comes in, and he's trying to start some badness, and he just like he headbutts the guy and then puts his head up against the thing. And he's just hitting him with his elbow. So that's where the Jack Reacher's elbow thing comes from. So just wanted to give a little context to the to the great name. So you can go ahead and read the super chat now. Yep. And, and the question is, in your opinion, which offensive and defensive recruits not currently training towards Notre Dame could be swayed by a big season playoff playoff appearance at least? Oh, I think there's a lot, Ryan. I think it's especially yeah. true in the 25 class. Yes. I, I, I think, yes. you know, I think, you know, but I, I, I like guys that are here's the problem. A lot of guys are waiting right now to commit compared to in the past. But does that mean they're waiting until July and August? Or does that mean we're going to see more and more kids get into the fall? The, re, the, the problem with recruiting kids based on your season is so many kids are decided by the time we get to the fall that yeah. now you have to flip them. And that makes it a little bit harder to do. But I, I certainly think there could be some receivers 
that could be impacted. Like, let's just say right now, a guy like Ryan Wingo loves Notre Dame, loves the school, loves the coaches, but he's like, but I also want to be a first round NFL draft pick at receiver. Sure. And right now, Notre Dame's offense isn't going to get me there, which would be a very fair assessment for Ryan Wingo to have. I couldn't fault him on that. Yeah. But then he goes out and he's like, wow, Notre Dame's, Notre Dame's doing some stuff. Could they maybe reunite with him, ignite with him? Sure. I've seen that throughout my career, Ryan. I remember even it's like 2010, I remember talking to a Notre Dame coach at the time. And after they ended the season with like five straight wins, blasted Utah, well, then they ended up just embarrassing Miami in the bowl game. They had right. kids that had turned them down, calling them after the bowl game, saying, hey, coach, are you interested again? And that was one of the things that got Aaron Lynch back interested in Notre Dame and why they were able to end up flipping him was he's a Florida kid that watched Notre Dame just physically – destroy Miami for 60 minutes. Yeah. And I was like, yo, the way that they finished the season, man. That, and so it happens. It just, it sparks interest, but it doesn't always then be enough to then just flip a kid to, to decide. So, you know, I, I could see something like that, It, but it's a small number of kids in the 24 class where you're going to yeah. see the season have a big impact is on the Talon Taylors. It's going to be on the 2025 quarterbacks, the George McIntyres, the Bryce Underwoods, the, you know, guys like that. I think that's where a season has a big impact because kids are just deciding so much sooner now, Ryan. Yeah, that it just it, it doesn't give you as much of a chance to really to really have that impact. Yeah, I think I think for me, twenty twenty five as well. The cornerback position, I think, is one that is going to be tremendously impacted as well because I mean, I think I've already talked to a couple guys, Brian, in the twenty twenty five of the cornerback group that mentioned Benjamin Morrison like firsthand. They're like, oh, you know, that was really crazy what he did as a as a freshman, if he follows it up with another big season and let's say Cam Hart has his best season to date as well. I mean, I think that you're looking at it and saying like, yeah, man, like to continue that cornerback train that Mike Nickens is starting to produce, right. With what he's gotten 2024 already, what he did in 2023. So I think a couple corners could be impacted. I, I like your note on wide receivers. I think that that is one that could, I mean, if Notre Dame takes an uptick there, they could really, I think make headway, not only with the wide receivers, but with quarterbacks, you know, you say like, Hey, Bryce Underwood, you know, like, you know, we, we know that you're going to be a tough cool, pool dog, but like, you see what Sam Hartman just did? Imagine what you right. could do with this, with this staff right. and with this team moving forward. So right. I think quarterback, wide receiver, some corner. I mean, Coach Biggins is doing a great job in, in general, but like, if he continues to show on field success that we saw last year and continues that, then even more high profile corners might want to come to Notre Dame as well. I think what this does, Ryan, more to Jack Reacher's elbows question is, it do, to me, it solidifies kids already in the class and then kids that like Notre Dame, but maybe they're not number one or number two with the kid. Right. It then can move them. I think, for example, I think the way the running backs played last year after the first couple games, I know for a fact had a big impact on Jeremiah Love. He liked Notre Dame a ton. We felt that Notre Dame was in a great place, but I think watching like the North Carolina game, yeah. had an impact it was but it was something that finalized it for him it wasn't where he was leaning to somewhere else because he committed like what a week later something like right? that yeah it yeah. was but it, it helps like okay this is where i wanted to go but now seeing in action what they were saying to me because it was the cal and north carolina games where you really saw chris tyree and the running backs really start to go and be used in the pass game and the run because even against cal you may who had the longest pass catch of the game on off, uh, I think it was on the entire offense, Ryan, but definitely at running back that game. It was all yeah. Jagestime. Yep. You know, and, and it was, uh, you know, just seeing seeing him uh, be able to go out there and, and make plays, you started to see the receivers, uh, it, uh, the running backs start to make a lot more plays. And that was something that didn't necessarily say, hey, you know, I was leaning towards AM or somewhere else, but boy, now I'm going to, to, to jump on board. It wasn't that. But watching those eight catches for 87 yards against Cal is something that was like, okay, they've been telling me they want to do this. Now yeah. I'm seeing it. Now I'm sold. And then against North Carolina, it was a very similar story, right? I'm pulling this up now against North Carolina. The running backs, she had Logan Diggs at three for 65 and a touchdown. Chris Tyree had four for 24. She had another six catches for 89 yards. So back-to-back -back games where the running backs had eight over 80 yards receiving plus the rushing. It, it's those kids that it moves, Ryan. It's those kids that, yeah. that they're already in that top group four and it solidifies it for them, I think, is where it has a bigger impact on the, the current class. The I, biggest swaying kids who may not be interested is always the, the next year's class. 
You mentioned Jeremiah Love, Brian. It always I, I feel like we really underrate how great of a job this coaching staff did in that Jeremiah yeah. Love co- recruitment. Because can we talk about what are the two games that Jeremiah Love went to last year to visit? It was Marshall and Stanford. Yes. And they still got it, man. Yes. It's wild. Yes. <laughs> wild. Yeah. yeah, it was um yeah, it was <laughs> I, I I thought about it the other day. I'm like, wow, he literally went to the two worst games of the year. That's wild, yeah. man. Absolutely yeah. wild. Yeah, it was um <laughs> but it was the selling thing that 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 yes. you get to, you know what I mean? Uh that you look at and say, okay, but it was it was the vision is what yeah. I'm referring to. No doubt. Um so I just it is kind of funny you say that. It reminds me of like the fact that Manti Teo visited when Notre Dame played Syracuse in 08 and lost. You know, like that's the game he visited for. And uh you know, <laughs> it was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, let's see here. Let's get to some more here, Ryan. Great, great question. Here we go from Josh Miller. Thank you, Josh, very, very much. Yep. Thank you, Josh. He says, if Marcus Freeman gets hired when Brian Kelly got hired, and only thing that changes is quarterback recruiting and assistant coach hires, does Notre Dame have one or more championships? So, I mean, mean, so, so hypothetically, we're talking about. Marcus Freeman now, right? Not obviously. I guess because like time. he been 23 at the <laughs> yeah. time, I would have assumed he probably wouldn't have been a very good football coach at the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I'll say this. If, if, if I'm, I'll say this, this is going to surprise some people. If Brian Kelly would have been done a better job with coaching, recruiting into quarterbacks and done a better job with assistant coach hires, he has a national championship. Somebody asked me yesterday, why don't you think Brian Kelly is going to win a championship at, at LSU? This right here. Yeah. Because of this kind of stuff right here. There was always something that he did that kept the team from winning. You know, Ryan, I was talking with Brian Smith the other day, and um, we were just kind of talking about the teams. And, you know, one of the things I push back on is, well, Notre Dame can't recruit a championship roster until they do X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, they've already done that. They've already had two teams that were capable of winning a championship if two things are different. In 2015, different strength coach, different defensive coordinator. I truly believe you're telling me that that 2015 team that almost beat Clemson on the road with freaking Brian Van Gorder as your defensive coordinator couldn't have beat a Jacob Coker-led Alabama team? That was a very good Alabama team. But it's not It's not like, it's not not like like the 2020 team that Bama yeah. had. Or the 2011 or 2012 team that Bama had, it wasn't as good as those teams. I think Notre Dame could have played with those teams, but why? It wasn't quarterback, it was quarterback development, but it was more so coaching. 2017, yeah. 17 team, the 2018 team, two teams that had opportunities to be there, but it was decisions that he made with because the Brian Van Gorder stuff put that team back in 17. But in 2018, you give me a better quarterback in 2018, and that team can play with anybody. I don't care what anybody says. Had one of the five best defenses in college football, solid offensive line that was still living off the Harry Heastan era, two monster receivers on the outside that were NFL high NFL draft picks. You had a running back that ended up not being a high draft pick, Ryan, but was a heck of a college running back in Dexter Williams. You had a drafted NFL tight end. The only thing that was different is Trevor Lawrence, Kyler Murray, Tua Tungavaloa, and Ian Book. One of these is not like the other, <laughs> right? One one is not a first round NFL draft pick, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and so they've been close. So if Brian Kelly simply would have done these things better, I think they'd have at least one championship. And then the thing is, well, 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 well if they won in twenty fifteen, doesn't mean they win in twenty eighteen. But my point is, imagine the recruiting boost they would have got from winning it in twenty fifteen. You know, and or or yeah. even losing the same way Clemson did where it's a barn burner back and forth game where people are like, yo, Notre Dame is legit. And it doesn't look like 2012 where they got embarrassed. So those are the things that even if BK would have done that, it would be there. Now, where does Marcus Freeman come into play? That's going to be a big thing. He's going to have to answer. If he's going to have success is can you recruit and can you and your staff be a part of recruiting and developing quarterbacks? Because I don't think Notre Dame had a quarterback recruiting problem. I think Notre Dame had a quarterback development problem. Sure. That's where I'm at. Because, you know, when you when you look at it, Ryan, 
your your starting quarterback should have in 2017 shouldn't have been Brandon Wimbush. It should have been Malik Zaire. Yeah. Imagine if Notre Dame would have developed Malik properly and he's your quarterback in 2017. And then Brandon Wimbush has developed properly. He's ready to take over in 2018 and he hasn't been ruined by Mike Sanford Jr. And he's a different quarterback. Then when Brandon's time is done, Phil Dracovic replaces him. You see where I'm going with this? This is the problem. It was quarterback development. Can Coach Freeman rectify that? We're going to find out. And 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 look, there's no excuses for Coach Gadouli and Coach Freeman over the next few years, Ryan. None. No. That quarterback room is loaded. Yes. And a guy with arguably as much talent, if not more than all of them, is coming next year. Right? So there's no excuse there. It's about recruiting. It's the development. And then the other one is, can he hire make good hires? And then when the hires he makes don't pan out, which is going to happen because it's happened to Urban Meyer, Nick Saban, Jim Tressel, yeah. Dabo Sweeney. I mean, it happens to every Kirby Smart. It happens to every coach. Can he recognize it and correct it? Now, correcting doesn't always mean firing. Correcting could mean, hey, I believe in this guy, but I didn't lead him the right way. Yeah. I, you know, and it could be that, or it could be you have to fire a guy. Can he make those changes or not? And that's always a question mark for a first time head coach. I'm not saying he won't, Ryan. We don't know. Exactly. It's well, but that, those are gonna be the questions. I, I think we he had something not not the same question, but it was similar when we were talking about Notre Dame yesterday, Brian. It's like, do I think that Marcus Freeman can win a national championship at Notre Dame? Yes, I do. Do I think he could be very successful at Notre Dame? Yes, I do. But it's still an unknown, right? Like that's my faith in it because I believe in the person running the deal and some of the moves that I'm seeing happen. But at the end of the day, like I, Josh, I just don't feel like I can answer this question appropriately because I don't 100% know what Marcus Freeman is as a coach. I, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure. I think I know. I think I have a good grasp on what he can be as a coach. But at the end of the day, we only have one year of data on this, right? Like we don't 100% know. So I think asking this in a couple of years is probably a little bit more appropriate. I mean, hopefully we don't have to have this conversation because it's like Marcus Freeman won a, na a national championship. So like, yes, the answer is yes, right? Like then the answer is an easy one, but just not enough data on, on Coach Freeman for me to have like a legitimate, if I threw him in at 37 years old in the BK shoes, would he succeed more? I think, but I'm not, I don't know. I, I would be lying if I said I knew. Yep, I saw it. Yeah, uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Ryan is is I think Brian Kelly missed opportunities to win a championship at Notre Dame because of things Agreed. he did. Now, did the administration support him the way that they should have in every capacity? No, they didn't. But did 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 he have the potential to win championships? Yes, he did, and Coach Freeman will as well. Even without look, and I'll tell you right now, the administration is not supporting Marcus Freeman enough. They're not, it's not even close to what they should be. Some things they should, in some areas they should be doing flat out. And I'm not, I'm going to talk more about this after the spring. Sure. But the point is Ryan, uh, when you look at it to me, it, it's one of those things where that's an excuse, not a, 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 a fatal flaw. In my sure. opinion, it means you've got to do things to overcome it. You've got things to work past it. It's harder, but it can be done. And it's okay. going to come down to coaching hires and quarterback development and recruiting. Now, the coaching hires thing, too, is that's where the administration needs to step up their game. Yes. They need to step up their game in a big way, and I'll have a lot more to talk about that. Hey, just a reminder, too, and I forgot to mention this, Ryan. We will have a second show tonight at 530. So there will be no Ivy Nation sports talk tonight. I will be on tonight at 530 with Sean Davis. And I'm hoping that Brian Smith will be able to join us tonight at 530 as well. We are going to cover the pending decision by Anthony Knapp, who is going to announce tonight at 530 uh, between Notre Dame, Penn State, North Carolina, NC State, and Georgia Tech. So we will have that tonight. So, yes, we will we will have that. It's at 530, not 6. So 530, we'll, we'll go live with that decision. So, yes, that's uh, that's going to be – that's going to be important, obviously. Yep. Here is another one. From Brandon Pledsner. Thank you for the super chat, sir. So does Notre Dame really require athletes to live in the dorms for three years? That is a terrible rule if true. Students should be able to live off campus after one year, in my opinion. 
I don't think that rule is the same anymore. I think they give exceptions to that. I'm going to disagree with your premise, though. I know why Brandon says that, because other schools allow it, and it's a re recruiting pitch. I don't agree with it, though. Have, as someone who's worked on college campuses, there's a lot of value to get students staying on campus in, in from a developing friendships, developing as a person, uh, the sort of uh, you, you're living in a communal type of atmosphere, which requires you to be thoughtful and mindful of others. Less opportunity and to get in trouble. Bingo. That's <laughs> yeah. the other thing. Yeah. And and so there, there's just I think there's a lot of reasons why it's it's advantageous to stay on campus longer. And, and I get it. It hurts with recruiting. But if a kid's not going to come to Notre Dame because he has to stay on the on campus for an extra year, he wasn't coming to Notre Dame anyway. He was going to find some reason to not want to be here. And so, like, when Cardinal Tate was talking about the dorms, that's a bullcrap excuse. If you wanted to be here, there's been a lot of great players better than Cardinal Tate that that had no problem doing that or didn't like it, but it was worth it because of all the value that Notre Dame brings. Now, should Notre Dame have old dorms? No, that's bullcrap. That's that's cheap. That's Notre Dame being cheap, again, as an institution. and not and You got these kids paying $70,000 a year. You can't give them freaking modern dorms, like updated dorms. That's just Notre Dame being cheap. Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, though, if if you value what Notre Dame can provide for you, then you suck it up for a little while, you know, and that's just the reality of it. But if somebody's not, and somebody doesn't want to do that, then ultimately they didn't really want to be at Notre Dame anyway, and they would have found some other reason, in my opinion. Yeah. So I don't really worry I, about it too much. I, I saw Brandon earlier said that uh, that a recruit had talked about this recently about Part the three years. I thought He's, it was Cardinal Tate, right? I or, thought he had said Jordan Young had said something about it in another gotcha. interview he did. So I'm going to have to check in on that. Actually. Yeah. There are except that's the policy, but Notre Dame allows exceptions for that. Gotcha. But at the end of the day, if that's why a kid doesn't want to come here, then that's the reality of it. Now, that doesn't justify the dorms not being up to date. That's a bull, that's bull crap, total bull crap. But it's just, it, to me, it's two different things. In theory, I think there's it's good for players to for students to be on campus longer i think that's a benefit in my opinion and, and ryan you hit the last one yeah so get in trouble yeah. a lot yes yep yes. yep i agree i agree <laughs> okay. all right here we got one from john a one john thank you again for the super chat if notre dame uses six wide receivers how many freshmen will play of the six that's interesting. At least one. I mean, because you're one. you're most likely going to have. Let's let's assume there's no injuries, right, Ryan? You're going to have yeah. Deion Colsey. Yep. Uh, or actually, you're going to have uh, yeah Deion Colsey. You're going to have Lorenzo Styles and Jaden Thomas. You're going to have Caleb Smith, the elder. Yep. You're going to have Tobias Merriweather. That's five. So barring injury, that's most likely five of the six. Yep. So you'd have one freshman. One freshman. If a yeah. second freshman is playing because and and not because of injury. The odds are pretty good, Ryan. That means that guy is a dude. Yes. I, mean, it, it, I don't I don't think people Here's, really realize how good this group is. Rico's looks great, yeah. but have you seen how many times Sam Hartman and Braylon James are connecting on bombs? I feel like I'm watching the same play again. That, I'm like, nope, not the same man, play again. That, that one down the sideline, though, over oh the shoulder. God, the house, that throw was ridiculous. But, yes. Braylon, but Bray, what was this Braylon's issue last year at times? And what was Braylon's issue the first day of practice? Tracking the ball down the field. Yeah. He tracked it beautifully and kept his feet in bounds. So you're already seeing that growth. But you know where that growth comes from, Ryan? Repetition. This team is throwing a billion bombs in practice right now. It is ridiculous. And that's a good thing because yeah. that's how it gets good. I'm working on a film breakdown now, Ryan. I went through a lot of Sam Hartman's 21 film, and I've got like 10 minutes worth of video. i got to pare it down a little bit that I'm going to do a, a, a kind of a breakdown video on here hopefully in the next few days. But, uh, I mean, those those Wake Forest receivers make a lot of plays on the football. It's Not, not every throw is just dropping on a dime. Sometimes sure. it's not a great throw. But you make those plays as a receiver because you've done it with that quarterback so many times. And then yeah. the quarterback gets faith that, hey, I just need to put it up for this guy, give him a chance because I know he's going to go make that play. That comes from repetition. And I love it's the fact that they're doing so much of that right now. Yeah, it's a trust thing, man. It's it really is, and like you said, I mean, there's a few guys in Notre Dame's roster that kind of excel in that area, right? You like to talk about Dion, you talk about Tobias should be very good in the air. Braylon James should be very good in the air as he continues to get stronger. So I keep talking, I keep saying it, man, but 
Sam Hartman has loved long receivers outside the numbers yeah. in his career, and Notre Dame certainly has some long receivers outside the numbers this year. There's Absolutely. no doubt about that. Yeah. Good question, John. Good, Very good question. Uh, and we, we did the uh, one from Brand on the Dorm, so let's get down to yep. another one here from Josh Miller. Josh says, dream season scenario, who do we play in the playoffs? Mine would be Michigan in the semis and LSU in the championship. That would I mean, it's cool. hard to go against that, man. <laughs> That's it's really, really cool, man. You know, because, like, you'd, you'd probably have a win over Ohio State and USC in the regular season. Yeah. Because if you're in the playoff and then you get to beat Michigan in the semis and LSU in the championship, that would be a dream season. I, I still would say, like – that is a dream season from from for me in my personal like my personal like revenge tour type scenario. I still believe, however, that a national championship ideally includes beating Georgia or Bama at some point, yeah. even if it's in the semis. So, to me, my dream scenario would actually be beating Michigan in the semifinals and then beating Bama in the title game, or beat or Bama or Georgia or beating Bama or Georgia in the semifinal, then beating Michigan in the championship. My dream scenario actually right now, I think about it. If I'm going to include what's best for Notre Dame, the program, because what would that, what would that do, Ryan? The first scenario, a, you just become the Kings of the Midwest. You beat yes. Michigan and Ohio state in the same year. You know, you're now the Kings of the Midwest because you have a national championship where Ohio state right now is the Kings of the Midwest deservedly. So, because a, they've won a championship in the last decade. And two since the 2000s started, whereas Notre Dame and Michigan have a combined total of zero since 2000. Ohio State has two. Penn State has none. Nobody has any except for Ohio State. And they're the best program. When you go out and beat them on the field, then you go out and win a championship. You're now the kings of the Midwest from a perception standpoint. And you did the same thing to Michigan. You beat Michigan, the only team that's really been like kryptonite to Ohio State the last couple of years. But then you beat them, and but then you also beat one of those, you know, you'd be one of those championship teams. Now you've kind of slayed the big dragon, the Georgia, the Alabama dragon, and you've beaten Clemson in the regular season. Like you've literally checked every freaking box that you can imagine. That's from yeah. a big picture standpoint. If I'm looking at this selfishly and what I would enjoy the most is two SEC teams make the championship, Georgia and LSU. Notre Dame plays – George in the first round, or plays LSU in the first round, beats them, then goes and plays George in the championship game. That would be the dream scenario for me, combining what the prestige would mean and then also with just the personal uh, revenge tour type of situation. Thoughts, yeah. Ryan? Well, no, I mean, I, I, immediately, literally, when Josh put the two teams out there, I was like, that's, that's it right there. Like, <laughs> what am I going to argue against that? I mean, oh, man, I mean, that would just – and this is me from a hatred perspective as a Notre Dame fan, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Michigan's it, right? Like, would love to defeat Michigan, especially because it's not a team that Notre Dame plays every year anymore, right? right? Like, that rivalry has, has gone away a little bit. But LSU is the team that I really want to get a shot at, man. Like, if I'm Notre Dame, it's just, look, call it, call it saltiness, call it whatever you want to call it, right? But – at the end of the day, that would be a great headline in order to beat an LSU team in a championship or in a playoff for obvious reasons. Like, you don't have to go into those reasons, right? So that would be fantastic. So, right. Josh, I think I think you might hit it for me, man, honestly. Like, I'm trying to – I think you gave a great scenario, Brian. Like, I think that it makes a ton of sense from the perception and then the moving forward aspect of everything. Right. But from my Notre Dame fandom, sure. I feel like this is the only answer. I feel like sure. it's the only answer. <laughs> yes, if we're looking at this purely as Notre Dame fans, you get a win yes. over Ohio State, a win over USC, a win over Michigan, and a win yeah. over Brian Kelly. Yes, as a yes. fan, it's a 100% dream scenario. The question that I would be is, do you want – I would actually reverse it, though. You want Michigan in the championship? Beat, beat LSU in the semis because then Kelly continues having never won a playoff game. <laughs> True. That's a good so, point. That's a good point. Yeah. That would be, I mean, either either way, I mean, because we talked about it yesterday that Michigan hasn't won a playoff game either, though. So either right, either way, right. one of those teams is winning. But I would much game, I'd but. feel better personally as a Notre yeah. Dame fan if Harbaugh got a win than if Kelly got a win, to yeah. be completely honest with you. Or maybe maybe if I go with your original conversation about play Michigan and then we beat one of the big SEC teams. What if LSU is has their, they control their own destiny in the SEC championship game, and they lose, and they don't right. make the playoff? That would be right. the other conversation we right. could have. If Notre Dame's going to beat LSU <laughs> in a championship game, I want it to be 
in a couple of years. Yeah. So like win the title this year, don't play LSU at all, play Michigan, beat Georgia or Bama and call it a day. Because here's why. I don't want to hear any freaking excuses from LSU fans about well, he doesn't he's still not there yet. He's only in year 2. He hasn't been able to get the roster where he wants it. Blah, blah, sure. Blah, blah, blah. sure. Do it in like two more years. Notre Dame gets their number two title because <laughs> now we're really in dreamland, right? Because he said dream sure. season scenario, right? So we're dreaming yeah. now. Yep. Um, but uh, <laughs> Antoine said, I know you dream of Brian. Somebody better wake you up. <laughs> Just let me have this, Antoine, okay? Just let me Seriously, have this. Seriously, man. Seriously. I would rather be in a couple years over LSU because then there's no excuses about what, you know, they don't have all of his recruits and blah, 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 blah. So that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. So man, yeah. yeah. But uh, of course, then there's a the scenario of I don't want Brian Kelly to ever make another playoff appearance. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. <laughs> All right, here we got one from Call Me Ty. Call Me Ty says, "How many gap closers and gap erasers do you see a realistic targets in the 2024 class?" The interesting well, one. Yeah, let's uh, let's remember first of all, Ryan. Let's define gap closer again for people that have forgotten or people who are somewhat new to our channel, because we haven't used that term as much. And we'll use it more over the summer when a lot of our stuff is more about the summer. But gap closer at this point in time, I think Ryan froze. Otherwise, he's just like enthralled, waiting to hear my answer right now. But um, gap closer is there's two types of gap closers, right? And then we'll, and the gla- gap eraser is different than that. A gap closer can be one of two things. Number one is someone who is by themselves is like, wow, this is a, this is an elite, you know, this is a big time player. He helps you at this position, really close the gap and, and just make a big jump. It's, it's the, it's the CJ Carr, Cam Williams, they're traditional gap closers. And so I think those are, those are one type one. And then type two is another one we talked about is where it's not one where you're like, you make this big leap towards being better or being on the same page of that team. It's, but it makes you better. So for example, let's look at last year's receiver core. Was there anybody in last year's receiving core that I view as like a no brainer five star right now, steps in day one and dominates kind of player. Like you'd think of a, of a gap closer or a gap eraser and we'll, we'll define gap eraser in a second. No, I don't think so. And there may not be a first round draft pick of this Notre Dame receiving core. There's guys with a chance to be that, but, but right now that, you know, they, they may not, they may not be there, but it could also be just a really good group that makes you better than what you were and better what you, than what you were is still closing the gap. There, so there's two different types of ways of that. A gap erasers, the elite of the elite. Uh, it's Keon Keeley. Uh, he's a gap eraser. Uh, he's that kind of guy. It's it's and there aren't many of those. That there there just aren't. And part of being a gap eraser is you have to beat one of those schools out for that guy, because you've erased the gap. Because now I got Keon Keeley, which means I got the stud, but you didn't even you didn't, and that's part of it too. So like that's why I look at those guys. So Keon Keeley's a gap eraser. Benjamin Morrison's a gap closer, right? Uh, yeah. Justin Scott's a gap closer. I think yes. Justin Scott's a very good player. He's not quite on that Keon Keeley level. And there may only be three to five of those guys a year, Ryan. I mean, there's only two or three of them last year. Yeah. Like to me, Dante Moore's a gap closer, borderline gap eraser. After him and Keon, Caleb Downs, right? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. After that, I don't, I don't know that there's a lot of guys that I would consider true gap erasers in my opinion. So yeah. uh, that's that's kind of where – like there was no offensive lineman that would be gap erasers because there's no gap to erase from sure. a talent standpoint, right? They're already there. But at, at other positions, there, there was only a handful of guys that I would view in that group last year. TJ Carr's a gap closer right now. Yeah, he could he could he could end up being a gap eraser by the time his high school career is over with. But right now he's definitely a gap closer, like the traditional like big time. OK, here you go. This kid has a chance to be that guy. But uh, there aren't a whole lot of gap. Er- gla- gap erasers are more classes. It's a group of players at a position that closes the gap. Sure. It's not often just one guy. But of course, quarterback, it would be unique in that regard. Do you, do you consider, um, let's say, a Cam Williams a gap closer? Yes. 
Yes. I mean, he's a top 50. If you're a top 100 player, you're a gap closer. I mean, sure. and if you're a top 50 player, you're at the top of that gap closing type of thing. No question. Okay. And I view Cam as a top 50 player. Yep. In my view. Uh, I think, and, and then the, the second, because what I defined, Ryan, was the second type of gap closer. If you remember, like for me, Owen Wafel's a gap closer to me in the in the secondary sense that he's not a top 50 to 100 player. He I have like 150 to 175, but he's bringing something that you currently don't have. Yeah. And, and that I think he can be a disruptive nose tackle that can that that is a bigger version of Howard Cross. Now, is he closing the gap and that, hey, we're going to beat Bama now because of him? No, he's a gap closer and that he's making you better at a position that right now you're not that good from a depth standpoint. And so there, that's where I say the two different types of players yeah. in that regard, like Jack Larson, not a gap closer. He doesn't move the needle at tight end because there's not much needle to move. Sure. Right. Uh, same thing with like Peter. They're good football players, but every position is different, in my opinion. Leonard Morin is not a gap closer to me. He's make he's continuing the strength of what you've done recently because yep. he's not quite on that Benjamin Morrison level. And I and I'm higher on Leonard more than most. So same. it's just it's um it's trying to be very fair with it and not just throwing every top 100 to 150 kid into that category. Sure. It's, it, it, there's context that's needed to those, right? And as I said, there's well, two different types of gap closers. Well, well, to, well, to that point, I think that for realistic targets, one guy that I would say at safety, I would consider a gap closer is Jalen McLean. And I would yes. consider him for two different reasons. One, because I think he's really good, man. Like a top hunter kid, in my opinion, right? And then number two is you need to continue to strengthen that safety room. I mean, your right. depth isn't great there right now, and you need more impact depth, especially. Mm -hmm. So I would say Jalen McClain is for sure a gap closer, in my opinion. There's yes. no doubt about that one. I don't view Kennedy Erlacher and Davis Andrews as gap closers. They're no. good football players that football would players. then make your – like, here's the thing. Can, let's just say their safety class is this, Ryan. Let's say they don't get Jalen McClain, just for argument's sake. Sure. And let's say they get uh, – trying to Gabriel get Kennedy or lacquer. Okay. Let's say that they get, um, uh, we were just talking about Davis Andrews yep. and I'm just trying to look for another guy. Mar that's Marquis in there. Galagos. Marquis Gallegos. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. None of those three guys by themselves are gap closers. That however, would be a gap closing class. Not because now all of a sudden you're on Bama's level, but it makes you better from where you are now. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's a minor move, but it's a move, and that matters to me. But in, to truly have a where you take a jump, you do need a Jalen McClain type of player. And yep. if you give me a Jalen McClain and a Davis Andrews and a Kennedy Erlacher, that's a big jump for me because of that one individual gap closer being in the class with two other good four-star caliber football players, in my opinion. Sure. So, well, uh, yeah. how, how about this one too, Brian? I mean, if you look at middle linebacker, would you consider Kingston Villamo Asa a gap closer as a Mike linebacker? Yes, because he's a Mike. Yes, yes. because yeah. I still don't know if Drake Bowen's going to be a Mike. Sure. You know, we, we don't know where Drake's going to play. They need – because th that, number one, top 100 player. Yep. So that plays a role in it. Number two, specifically being a Mike, yes, he does. It, almost every top hundred player is going to be a, a, a gap closer to some degree with the exception of really tight end and line, offensive line. Sure. And that's, and that's just because the gap's already closed. You're already there. Now it's about maintaining that level of excellence. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, there, those are, those are guys like now guys in the board, Ryan. So on the class, in the class, we talked about CJ and we talked about Cam Williams. Those are the guys in the yep. class. Yep. I don't view Aeneas Williams as a gap closer. It's just about continuing to go. I, I don't view Anthony Carey or Kedron Young as gap closers. I think they are about continuing excellent recruiting already, in my Agreed. opinion. Agreed. Wide receiver of guys, uh, to me, th there's there's a lot of receive, gap closing receivers on the board, in my opinion, yeah. because of, yes, last year's class was very good, but you need another one. You need 100%. another really strong class, you know. So to me, Josiah Brown is because why, Ryan? He brings something you don't have a lot of on your roster right now, which is pure 
home run speed. Speed. Right. Yeah. I, I view yeah. Isaiah Canyon that way from a potential standpoint, but he's still raw. So his upside is there, but I wouldn't call him right now that player now. But the upside is certainly there, in my opinion. Uh, you look at some other guys on the board for me that I would view as gap closers. Jason Robinson, because he brings a skill set that you don't necessarily have. Not much uh, of those it, are some yeah. those are some receivers that to me are are true gap closers. But like you can make a case for like Micah Gilbert, you can make a case for Quasi Gilmer. The reason I wouldn't necessarily put those guys on there, even though I think they're excellent players, is because they're bringing skill sets similar to what you already have a, a decent amount of. It's more sure. about continuing that. The gap closers at receiver are those really athletic, dynamic, make plays kind of guys. I think there's a lot of those. Like Jeremiah McClellan, to me, is not necessarily a gap closer to me. They have guys like him. It's a good player. It's a good top 150 to you know kind of guy. I don't view him in the same way that I do like a Jason Robinson. I think Jason Robinson is a top 100 player, and I think if he was 5'11", he'd be viewed a lot differently nationally because yeah. he is a dynamic player, in my opinion. It's really nuanced for his age, too, man. He really... Mm -hmm. He really gets it, I think. I think he gets the game of football. He sees it at a very advanced level. Yeah. So, Brian, obviously Notre Dame's after two very high upside tight ends. I know you already mentioned tight end at Notre Dame has, has you know, been historically a very strong unit, but would you consider either Jaden Riddell or Carter Nelson a gap closer or not as No, much? I I literally don't think in, that there's a chance to have another gap closer at tight end. I, I, if there was another Michael Mayer coming in, I don't think you can close the gap when you already have the best tight end in room in the in tradition in the in the country i just i don't think that's doable and i think that's true for notre dame and georgia i think both of those programs right now can't land a gap closer the gap's closed you're the gap that like you're the gap setter at that point yeah. in time people are now trying to chase you what i think it does right and it's important is a guy like Jaden Riddell, especially because he's got a higher floor but even a guy like carter nelson who's got a very high ceiling because i said this the other day Right now, Jaden Riddell is the better player, significantly the better player. Oh, I agree. Carter Nelson has a slightly higher ceiling, in my opinion. I agree. They're both excellent players. What they do is they maintain your dominance. That's why they're coming. There's no left tackle that can be a gap closer because you already have the best left tackle in college football. It's about can you maintain that yeah. level of brilliance. So Gearby Lambert can't be a gap closer. He's a borderline top 50 recruit. With five star upside, he's not a gap closer. There's no gap to close at left tackle. I mean, name me a team in college football that's good, that over the last decade since Zach Martin was there, where your worst left tackle was Liam Eikenberg, who's a, <laughs> a, a, a consensus All American in the second round draft pick. Sure, he's the low guy on the totem pole <laughs> for the last decade. N there is no gap to chase or close at left tackle for Notre Dame. They're about to have – they've have they've had now what? In the last decade, the only non-All-American they had was freaking Zach Martin, who should have been an All-American because his Seriously. 2013 season was disgustingly good. Yeah, But the tradition hadn't been established yet. The reputation – he set the reputation that others then built off of with their success. So I just don't think that there's a gap. Now, there are some gap closers at guard and definitely center potentially, but not at tackle in my view. I mean – who are you going to get that's better than what you've had, right? I mean, and the same is true at right tackle. They, Robert Hainsey, a third-round pick, is your low man on the totem pole as you're starting right tackles in the last decade. Yep. You know, because those left tackles all came from right tackle. It's just been like a revolving door from right to you – know, Ronnie was at right tackle, moved to left. McGlinchey then replaced him, moved to left. You know, and then steps in Robert Hainsey, right? Now Blake Fisher. So Notre Dame's tackle tradition is as good as anybody in the country right now. There's no gap to close. Yeah. Right. And so that's the way I kind of look at that. Those two, I, Ryan. I, I think I think interior defensive line. There's a, a few that I can name oh, that yeah. I would consider gap closers. I mean, you mentioned Justin Scott. You mentioned Owen Wafel as that potential guy. I mean, if they get yeah, in, those David, are two different types of gap closers. So, yes. So that people understand. Yeah. I mean, if they get David Pele Pele, who you know to add size to that interior, that's a that's a close the gap because again, that's one thing that Notre Dame needs to continue to get right. is more size and impact size, right? right? Like guys that can make plays, not just be there, right? Like that's kind of yeah. what Notre Dame needs more of. So David Pelle Pelle, I think, was a guy that could be in that conversation. We mentioned Kingston at Mike, mentioned Jalen McClain at safety. I think that's all I'm comfortable with calling gap closing at this point. Like, yeah, I think I think that's it. Yeah, yeah that's why. So, again, it's, it's different at different positions, right? Edge, yeah. you know – 
the guys that they're on at edge, honestly, if I'm if I'm being real about it, Ryan, there yeah. aren't any edge guys right now that I think they have a shot at that that I view as gap closers. The only guy that's that might visit right now that I view that way as a gap closer, there's yeah. two. And they're in different forms. Elijah rushing flat out gap closer. Yes. Flat out. Yep. There's two other guys that I that as I look through the list that I think could be gap that I would view gap closers from an upside standpoint. And that's Darian Mayo and uh Malachi Williams. And it's debatable with Malachi Williams because he's so raw. But Darren Mayo has gap closing potential, but he's still raw. He's very sure. raw. Those are the only edge players that I look at and say, those guys have, like, to me, like, there's good players. Logan Thomas is a good football player, but yep. you have him already. I mean, you have guys like him. It's about, are, are you getting next level players on the edge at that position? Agreed. That's yep. the bigger question mark to me. It's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, yeah. I know Brandon in the chat said, you know, would you consider Bronte Johnson a sa- at safety a gap? Closer? No, um, yeah, yeah, yes, but but in the first sense, not the prime, not the big sense. Yeah, Bronte is a very raw player. He's very athletic, but he's a very raw player. Agreed. But Agreed. you know, he 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 would be he would be that in a, in a in a like he's not my number one safety on the board. Jalen McLean is. Bronte's my number two right now. Left on the well, yeah. honestly, he's my number three, and. Davis Andrews is my number two safety on the board. I That's love Davis Andrews. Love that guy. You, you know uh, who would be Bronte, a, um... but Bronte has a higher ceiling though, Ryan. Sure. It's sure. just, there's a big gap in, in where they are right now today as players. You know who, you know who could quietly would have been a gap closer, but Notre Dame is, you know, it's just probably not going to work out is Tylan Singleton at Rover would be a gap closer to me, Brian. Like that would be a gap closer at yes. the Rover position. Yeah. 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 Because you you really only got one guy there that maybe projects there in the future, and that's a maybe in Jaden Osbury. Yes. And I still think he probably ends up being a will. Before we move on, just a reminder to, to people, uh, cornerback, there's not a gap. Like even Caleb Beasley, Aaron Scott, they're not gap closers. They're building on the tradition that you've established. Because right now I would argue Notre Dame has the best cornerback room in the country, and they just signed this past season one of the best cornerback tandems in the country as well. Right. Yep. You could you you'd have to be a a you'd have to be a top 10 national type player corner. You'd have to be a Derek Stingley type of guy for me to. to but that's more of a gap eraser. Like it's now completely erased, in my opinion. So it just depends on position by position. Like Tyler Eargas, you know, Jaden Riddell wouldn't be one for you. I just want to make sure I'm clear. It, it It's not always just about is this a really good player or not? You have to have a gap to close to be considered a gap closer. Yes. Right. Like. Did Trevor Lawrence close the gap for Clemson a quarterback, or did he just extend it? Right, because you already had a championship quarterback. You replaced him with another championship quarterback. There was no gap to close. It was about continuing that level of dominance. When Alabama goes out there and gets a five-star defensive tackle last year and gets Keon Kelly, did they close the gap? No, they widened the gap. Widened the gap, yeah. You know, yeah, ext- and that's what you could argue maybe with a Jaden Riddell is he's a gap widener. You can maybe sure. we could make come up with that and you know and come up with that phrase. That's what he is because the gap there's no gap to close, is the point. You've now as maybe you entrench yourself even further into that position. I guess that'd be a good right. way of explaining it, Ryan. Yeah, that's a good way. So, for yeah, sure, you can't close the gap if there's no gap to close. You okay. know, and so that's why I say tight end, left tackle. There's there's no gap to close <laughs> at this point in time. You know, so. Yeah, it's good. Good questions. Good questions. That's a good question. All right, Ryan. Here we go. Uh, now, Charlie. So Charlie Weiss. Charlie Weiss. Last belt loop did not hey, has a couple super chats, but he's now given two super chats. One we have a question, but then the other one he gave just to support the cause. So I'm going to bring up this nice. question from him, Ryan, and I'm going to read it and I'm going to let you answer it. Okay. So Charlie says, "Would you consider what would you who would you consider a big time D line hall currently? Of the realistic options on the board, Charlie." One for me, I mean, Justin Scott's the the main conversation, right? Like you need to get Justin Scott. So it all starts and ends with Justin, in my opinion. So big time defensive line hole, though. You already have Owen Waifel in the class. If you get a Justin Scott into the class, I mean, yeah, yeah. You get those two in the class. And I think after that, man, you're talking about we need to find some le- do- that size. I think that another – for me, I would want a third guy that might project 
as a big end or into the interior. So TJ Lindsay is a guy that I really like a ton, but you could also sell me on David Pele Pele. If you just want to get three interior guys and then focus more on the interior and then get, get more of the edge in 2025. But I think that you need to get three of those big bodies. That would be a great starting point. And then after that, man, you need to find some pass rush on the outside. I mean, Brian mentioned a couple already, like Malachi Williams, I think would be a home run addition with the upside that he has. You can talk me into Logan Thomas, but I mean, Darian Mayo is another guy. So I honestly would focus more on the interior in this cycle and get those big bodies. And then I would try to find one high upside edge in this class at least, right? So I don't know, Brian, for me, like I look and I say, Wayful, Scott, one of TJ Lindsay or David Pele Pele, and then the edge, a guy like a Malachi Williams or Darian Mayo would be a great opportunity for you. You know, like I would say Jacob Smith and I wouldn't hesitate on it, but again, we're getting into the conversation of if you take Jacob, you're taking Jared and that's taking up one spot with yeah. probably a good player, but maybe not an impact player. Give me Darian level. Mayo and Logan Thomas over the Smith twins, right? That, that'd be my point. I think Logan Thomas can be part of a gap closing class. He may not be an individual that way, but I think you need a you need a viper in this class, and he's a good four star caliber player. So I don't think in order to be a gap closing class, every guy has to be a gap closer by himself. And and the reality is, Ryan is is there is no conversation of gap closing without if you're not talking about Justin Scott being in it. There's there's no hope for that to be a class of gap closing without that. I think Darren Mayo. You talk about a dream scenario, a realistic dream scenario, Ryan. I've got is, Bryce Young when I was going through my list yeah, as well. He'd be yeah. he'd be a part of it, but like right now, a dream scenario for me would be Justin Scott, Owen Wafel, Darian Mayo, um, Bryce Young, and I'm trying to think of a a, a viper to, to that would fit that role. You know, I, uh, Malachi I, Williams. Did you, did you like Anelu Lafayette out of I don't, Hawaii? There's not a lot of film on him. I've yeah. only seen like 10 clips of him, so I really don't know. I've heard good things about him, but I haven't seen him. Give me some Viper like that, and I'm, I'm feeling good. The, the, the ideal scenario is, you know, yeah, you could flip an Elijah rushing, but, you know, that's I don't think that's overly realistic as of right now. Sure. So, but if you give me a class of Wayful, Justin Scott, Darian Mayo, Bryce Young, and and Logan Thomas, I'm feeling great about that D line class. Right. Not every single guy is a great player, but as a group, it's good because I still think Notre Dame needs a, one more year of getting big guys. I don't think last year's class just fixed it all by itself. I think you need I need another year because if some of those guys don't pan out or they get injured, now you're back to square one. Sure. I do think that it need one more year of just give me some bigs. And that's why I'm kind of focused on, to your point, Ryan, interiors and big ends in this yes. class. And then you give me a Logan Thomas type of guy to, to go with them, a Malachi Williams type of guy to go with them, I'm feeling great. Because now all of a sudden our talk, conversation about Al Washington changed completely. If you can get that kind of class. The three top Vipers in 2023 season are all potentially back in 2024 as well, right? So it's not like an immediacy. So I think like if you find one Viper that has a decent upside to him and he can develop behind potentially Jordan Batello coming back, potentially, right? Having Joshua Burnham, having Junior Toya Labaka, then you could talk me into that one, man. You mm -hmm. could talk me into that. So, yeah, yeah. agree. So that'll be um, – I don't see any scenario in which the, the linebacker class is gap closing. I think yeah. Kingston could be that by himself. For one position, right. But not as a whole. There's just not enough guys on the board to me that fit that. Now, if you could give me Kingston and Tyler Singleton, Ryan, now we're, now we're, man, we're, now we're cooking with oil now, buddy. Yes. You know, so I uh, love that. Now, I, I never say cooking with grease because I don't cook with grease. So <laughs> – Cook with, yeah. cook with um with, cook with pig oil. fat, yeah. Yeah, I don't cook with grease. I don't cook with grease. Not that anything wrong, but I just don't. I just don't. Cooking All right, with lard, man. Cooking with lard. Yeah, he, he, here's one, Ryan. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up to ask for you. It's okay. from Brandon Plesner, and he says, Ryan, where would you have Hartman going in this year's NFL draft? Uh, I think um, like right now, 2023. So yeah. let's let's do that, and then I'll ask the second part of the question about the 2024 year. Thank you. In this class, Brandon, Sam definitely would have been drafted because the 
So this quarterback class kind of falls off a cliff a little bit, in my opinion, after the top four guys. You know, you still have Hennon Hooker, who's going to be a really good day to pick, in my opinion. But then you're talking about guys like Jake Hayner, Tanner McKee, like, you know, just solid players, right? I think Sam uh, can Hartman. I, can I interrupt you? Yeah. If, if I could put Jake Hayner in Tanner McKee's body, that's a heck of a prospect. Oh, I like Jake Hayner a lot, man. Yeah, he's going to stick small. around in the NFL for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah I agree. Little. Yeah, he's but he's got a pretty good arm, man. He's really yes. smart. And he's a gamer. Well, he's got that's some what I'm gamer saying. If you could put him and Tanner McKee's body, if yep. Jake Hayner is 6'5", 220, oh, we're going having to a completely <laughs> different conversation about the quarterback board right now is my point. No doubt. No doubt. I agree 100% on that one. For me, though, Brandon, like about Sam, I, I think Sam would get drafted, but I think it'd be somewhere in the day three range, like probably fifth round, give or take right there, right? Like fourth to six, somewhere in that ballpark. And I know we're going to get into like evaluation for next year, but I, I think the thing that we lose sight of, it's not always just about production when you're projecting to the NFL, right? Like production matters. What you do on the field matters. But the things that move the needle for NFL scouts to saying what is – so what's translatable to winning on the next level is the physical traits, right? And that's where I think Hartman's just solid and not great, right? Like he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's six foot one, 208 pounds, 210 pounds. His arm strength is solid, not great. His athleticism is solid, not great. Like there's nothing physically that really pops with a guy like a Sam Hartman, which I which is why I don't think that he would be Two, like it, honestly, if he would have gotten feedback to be like a day two pick this year, I think he probably would have entered the draft and not go on to Notre Dame, for instance, right? So I think fourth through sixth round would have been this year for, for me, Brian, somewhere in that ballpark. Because I just think the physical traits aren't outstanding, but he's just you know he's a gutsy, good quarterback who has sees the game at a high level. Right. right. This is so. Let me get to this part two. Yes, this will be an interesting one. Say he has a season with 3,000 yard passing yards, 25 TDs passing with single-digit INTs. Where would you project him in the 24 NFL draft? Can I can I take a shot at that one, Ryan? Sure, and then I want to see if if I'm learning from you, from learning from my, my, my draft expert. Yeah. I don't think those numbers in today's era move the needle at all for Sam Hartman. If anything, I think it confirms that he's not a big-time quarterback. If all he has is Jack – you basically just gave me Jack Cohn's season. You know, 3,100 passing yards, 25 touchdowns, seven picks. If Sam Hartman repeats Jack Cohn's success, that does not move the needle for me. What he needs to do, in my opinion, to 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 move up, because I think based on that scenario, Ryan, I would say he's probably drafted the same spot that you just said he's going to be drafted now, day three guy. Yep. Yep. For me, what Sam needs to do is show that I can run a, a more of a pro-style offense, but I got to show that I can repeat that same level of production against the Notre Dame schedule a, with the Notre Dame pressure cooker and and lead Notre Dame to success as a team. I think and and I think that's got to come also with mechanical improvement. And hopefully he can cut down on the interceptions a little bit, maybe three, but if he throws 10 or 11 interceptions this year and and repeats the yards and the big plays and the 30 high 30 touchdowns, I can live with 11 interceptions. I I can as long as they're gutsy interceptions i don't want dumb interceptions but if they're like yeah i tried to make a play there i can live with that because i know that that means the next five times he's going to make a play i think you need from sam hartman at least 35 to 3700 yards and 30 plus touchdowns and and i'm talking like 33 34 kind of like ian book through in 2019 and then also the technical improvement of being more of a pure pocket passer i think we need to see that stuff from yeah. him because i think people are going to be surprised at how how well he throws the deep ball. I think right now, I mean, he's young, he's older, but to me, he brings more pure NFL talent to the table if he can prove that than what Sam Howell did. And Sam Howell's about to be a starter in the National Football League this next year. So that was that's my answer, Ryan. How wrong mm -hmm. am I? Let me hear it. I wouldn't say you're wrong. It's just a very subjective question, right? I, for me, Brandon, though, I Raw numbers aren't going to move the needle for me in general, I don't think, right? Because we've seen Sam Hartman put up really good numbers. Yeah. I, I I get your point, Brian, of like playing against better level of competition. Yeah, numbers at Notre Dame are that. different than numbers at Wake Forest. Sure, that's, but but that's the I, I, I guess my early point was it's the physical profile is right. what I'm talking about with Sam Sam Hartman, right? Like him him producing at the end at college level just in general, that's great. That's wonderful, you know. But we've seen a lot of guys produce at a high level that weren't good NFL players because they just lacked 
some type of physical profile. I think for me, the one thing that you said here, Brandon, that if so interception totals can be a little misleading at times because there's guys mm-hmm. some years that have low interception totals, but like there were a few that could have been intercepted, but just, you know, bagged off someone's hands. Or, or someone they're low catch. interception totals like Ian Booker because he refused to take any chances throwing the football. Yeah, exactly. Right. But I do think if Sam Hartman s- shows a better understanding of being a little more careful with the football, because the one thing about Sam is that could Sam start some games in the NFL? Sure. I think that it's possible. But the baseline for Sam has to be that you're a really good backup at worst, right? Like you have to have a floor to you. So showing that you're a better processor and not processor, that's the wrong word. Saying that showing that you're a better mitigator of risk at times, I think would go a long way to his evaluation because some NFL teams are going to say, you know, at worst, you need to be a good backup quarterback for me. Well, the people that are good backups are guys that don't make a lot of mistakes, yeah. right? That can keep you guys just kind of churning right. along, not, you know, not kill you type of thing. The game manager, quote, quote unquote. So I think that if Sam Hartman has a big season, though, and he shows that he can alleviate some of the risks that he's taken in the past or or some of the interception totals, I think he can sneak on to day two. I think it's possible. Yeah. Like third rounder type of conversation. I think it's, I, I think it's possible. I th- Here's my thing, Ryan. Yeah. Where did Ian Book get drafted? Fourth round. Fourth round, right? Yep. It, Sam Hartman's a better talent than Ian Book is in a lot of ways. I don't think he throws with quite the zip that Ian does. But Sam Hartman's got, a, I think, a better arm than people give credit for. And Ian Book's not that really that much bigger. I think you're looking at this as a pure scout, and I get it. I'm looking at this more of, of someone who studies what the the stupid things the NFL does or the way the NFL looks at it. And I, I, I fully believe that if Sam Hartman goes out there and has a 37, 3,800 yards passing at a place that's only had – Two quarterbacks ever do that and throws for 33 to 35 touchdowns and 10 picks. I think you're going to see it's going to be because why? He throws a great deep ball. He's going to have to tack down the field. He's going to have to tack the middle of the field. He's going to have to clean up his footwork, clean up his decision making. Right. So it's to me, it's in the NF, we've seen guys that aren't that much bigger than him or aren't bigger than him be day two draft picks, in my opinion. The question for me is going to then be, and here's where we we don't have context for this question is the other part of this too is who's in next year's draft. Sure, that's the other part of it, right, Ryan? Like, if next year's draft is like um, Drake May, Caleb Williams, and then not a whole lot else after that, then Sam could have a Jack Cone type season and still go on day two because it's just the way quarterbacks are drafted. So I think that factors into it as well, but I. I just really believe if he has a monster season that it's going to bump him potentially into day two, to your point. Now, am I saying first-round pick? No, I don't think his profile is ever going to allow him. His profile plus his age is never going to allow him to be a first-round pick. Unless Sam Hartman grows three inches this offseason, that's just not going to happen. I think it's dumb because, I mean, we're going to see Will Levis get picked in the first round. And I'll take (laughs) Sam Hartman over Will Levis every single day of the week. Right now, forget what he's going to do at Notre Dame this year, but that's a different conversation for a different day, my friend. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I mean, because the person that you compared him to was Sam Howell, right? And even Howell right. slipped to the fifth, fifth round, round fourth, right? Fifth round? Fifth yeah, I know round, like four yeah. Or five. Yeah. But uh, Sam didn't have the body of work either, and Sam was coming off of a couple not great years as well. And I think – Sam's going to – if Sam has the kind of production you and I are talking about, he, he's going to be coming off a couple really good years. I mean, Sam Howell's last year at North Carolina. And then, again, I, I realize that stats aren't the end-all, be-all, but I think they, they matter. His last two years, I didn't think he was great. His last year was perfect. This last year, 3,056 yards, only averaged 8.8 yards per attempt and 24 touchdowns and nine picks. They ran the ball a lot. But there was a lot of bad film that year as well from Sam that last year. And I'm a and you know me, I love Sam Howell as a college quarterback. I just don't think he was helped a whole lot. I think that hurt him. If Sam would have come to Notre Dame this past year, and you know, maybe things would have changed a little bit. Who knows? But I, I'd be curious. Where well, let me ask you this. This is kind of a fun where would if let's say Sam Howell would have taken a grad transfer to somewhere good, Notre Dame, somebody needed a grad transfer quarterback. Mm-hmm. 
and thrown for 3,500 yards, 31 touchdowns, and eight picks. In this draft class, where does he go? Is it similar? Because like last year's draft class was terrible, and he still went in the fifth round. He He's probably the – in this class, he's probably the sixth quarterback off the board. He's probably he's probably fighting Hendon Hooker to be the fifth guy okay. somewhere on day two, in my opinion. What would be the thing that could get him over Hendon Hooker? Would it just be the injury history? It would it would be the injury and just kind of I I mean I yeah it, it'd be mostly the injury because I was gonna say like you know the meetings and stuff, but like Hendon Hooker's a really smart good kid too, so like yeah. he's not gonna lose anything there. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah it's it's the injury I think more than anything. Yeah. And he's younger. Thinking. He's a lot younger right. than Hendon. Hendon's right. already 25, and yeah. Sam still would have been 22. Yeah. So, Right. Good one. It's good. good discussion. John A1 with a super chat. John says, as a position coach, how do you balance coaching a guy that has tools, uh, t- tools you love but doesn't know how to use, uh, versus a guy who is further along um, from a technical standpoint? And then uh, I, further along yeah. technically but doesn't have the tools desired – for the position, is it much more of a priority to spend the time coaching to the kid with tools, or do you coach the uh, group or wait until next year? I mean, I, I I think that John, it's a, it's a very good question because there is a balance that needs to happen, right? Because different, it's like teaching. Every student or every player you have has different needs to learn, right? Like they have different needs. In this situation, there needs to be. There needs to be consistency across the board, right? There needs to be consistency. But I personally, for a player that is a little further along technically, and then another kid that is not further along technically that needs more refinement, I'm spending more with the latter there, you know, because at, at some point, like you're you're trying to really get that younger player or that kid that needs more refinement, you're trying to get him to a higher level, right? I would argue that if I spend most of my time with the player that has more technical refinement, but it's just kind of a limited ceiling that I'm that he is already too close to what his ceiling is. Right. So I think that prioritizing the younger player in this scenario is a little bit more beneficial for the entirety, because if I spend the time with the kid that maybe is close to their ceiling, then I'm going to set back the kid that has more potential, but is just not getting the, the consistent coaching in, in this environment. Right. So I think that for me, I would definitely spend, you know, I'm trying to, to leverage my time a little bit more to the toolsy younger player, because I just don't think that the other scenario is a player in this, at least how you phrased it of a kid that's going to get a ton better. Right. That's more about like men's mental side. Like let's spend some time in the, in the, in the film room and really start to under, develop that mental side, even more than the physical profile is. I'm spending more time with Aaron Banks than I am Robert Hainsey. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm coaching them both, but Robert's already Good. he's good right it's just about maintaining and building on some things with Aaron it's like I got to really work to get this guy this guy's a dude I got to work to get him yeah. going so well, I think that's kind of how I look at it it's, it's even like this John we talked about jo- uh, you know, Joe Walt and Blake Fisher right on the practice field I'm spending more time with Blake Fisher because we know that there's more refinement needs done but then when we go into the weight room coach Bayless Joe, uh, Joe Alt, get him stronger brother like there's different mm-hmm. avenues I think too of like where the development is Joe Alt technically is further along than Blake. So I'm spending more time with Blake, but in the weight room, Joe Walt needs a little bit more time potentially. Right. If that makes sense. It does. It does. Keith Wiegan says, uh, Brian, do you know if some of the girls in the softball team get a full scholarship ride? I don't believe any of them do. And number one, I, I you're it's, it's a really weird thing. You can give, you only have like, I think like 11 or 12, um, full scholarships. And what teams will do is most players, like they'll give like two thirds of a scholarship away. And you can give up to 18 players two-thirds of a scholarship, which I think is stupid. Yeah. But that's just kind of the way it works. But, yeah, most – baseball is the same way. I mean, basketball and football, men's and women's basketball and football are, are, are two of the very few sports where you actually get full-ride scholarships to student-athletes. Most other kids are on some sort of partial. I think track actually might be a full-ride scholarship situation as well, but I'm not 100% certain on that. But I know baseball, you can literally not have a full roster of scholarship players. Just it's wild. I think it's stupid. Yeah, but you know, it is what it is. But yes, the the NCA here's the NCA Division One school can award eighteen softball players each a two third scholarship and still meet the limit of twelve per school because you only have twelve per year. 
and so they give partials. You can't give a partial scholarship in football. It's not allowed. You can't give a partial yeah. scholarship in basketball. It's not allowed. So it's a di- completely different set of – which makes recruiting a completely different animal than what some of these other schools are doing. Because, like, here's the thing. If you're like Coach Gump, for example, there may be a girl you love as a player, but she there's no way she can afford a third of the f- ride to Notre Dame. Like just – you know what I mean? Like it just, it may, it just, it's going to limit you to some degrees with that. It's just like the walk on thing. It's hard to recruit walk ons to Notre Dame because they got to be able to afford to go to Notre Dame. And a lot of people can't. So it's a unique situation. Paul A with a super chat. Paul, thank you very, very much. Uh, appreciate that and your support for what we're doing today. Just a reminder for people who may have jumped in late, we are only answering super uh, chats today because this is part of our show that we're doing to raise money for the strikeout cancer initiative that the Notre Dame women's softball team had. If you weren't with us being the show, we had coach Deanna Gump, who is five wins away from winning more games as a head coach at Notre Dame than any other coach right now. She trails trails coach McGraw by four. Wow. And then when you're in, when you're in territory with Muffin McGraw for all time wins at Notre Dame, you've done some stuff. Yes. Right. And she's never missed the NCAA tournament ever in her 22 years, of, except for the COVID year when everyone missed it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she's done doing a great job. But they are doing a strikeout for cancer thing this weekend. Uh, the entire three game series against Pitt, which starts Saturday night at Friday at six o'clock at Melissa Cook Stadium, is geared towards also raising money for this goal, which is to battle uh, childhood cancer. But it's not geared towards the research, but to help the families that are actually now going through it. She detailed all the different things that they do. It's a tremendous cause. So all the super chat money that we raised today is going to every single penny that we get from Google for super chats today is going to go to that cause. So that's why today we are only answering super chat. So if you want to have a question answered today, you have to use a super chat. If you want to hang on to it until tomorrow or Friday, you can, but those are the only questions that we're answering today. Also a reminder today that our second show is going to be at 530 we're going to be covering the commitment of Anthony Knapp. So we will go who's going to decide between Notre Dame, North Carolina, um, Penn State. Georgia Tech, Penn State, and NC State. So we'll have that at 530 as well. Just a reminder that we will uh, we will be live for that as well. So just wanted to give you all a heads up on that. So some of y'all are asking questions that we're not answering. It's because we're only doing Super Chats today. It's just part of the deal that we're doing. We have a Super Chat here from Hawk Strongest, and then he followed. If you've given a f- Super Chat where you just offered support, we will then answer a later question from you. He had one. He says, even if T- Tyler Buckner doesn't start, do you guys still think he'll play a big role? It, yes, but I think we need to understand what that role might be, right? Like, it doesn't have to necessarily be – it doesn't have to necessarily be just that he's going to play on the field in a some type of – niche role, right? Like think about what he did in 2021 as kind of a de facto Wildcat quarterback and kind of gave you a little bit of that change up package. I think Brian, for me, does he play a big role? Yes. Because if he buys into the program and what they're selling and he's, and he's in it and, and comes back for 2024, then he could potentially be the starting quarterback, right? So yes, he could play a big role because I think you're not just talking about the short term for me, Hulk, like you're talking about the long term as well. If Tyler Buckner really buys into the development, even if he's not the starting quarterback, could he have an impact? Yes, he can have a long-term impact because he could be the starting quarterback in 2024 if he really buys into the development and the vision that the coaches are selling him. So short-term, could he have some impact in some type of a niche role if he doesn't win the starting job? It's possible. But I think the long-term impact is even bigger for me. Yeah, Ryan, I'm I'm still really torn on what to do with Tyler Buckner this season. Really yeah. torn because part of me is like, he is too dynamic of a football player to not be doing something. But the other part of me is saying, yes, he can help my football team right now, even if he's not the starter. Having said that, I think your point about the future is really important because the other the other way to look at it, Ryan, is, the, is this way, is imagine if he just took the year where we're going to maybe sacrifice a, a potential weapon for the team in order to get him ready to – be that guy next year, then all of a sudden you've really made him better and it's the best thing for him and the kind of player he could be in that regard. That's kind of where I look at it, Ryan, and say part of me is really attracted to the idea of still falling away to have him play because he's just too good not to play, sure. but also realizing the potential benefit that could come to him down the road if he doesn't play. 
yep. this year. It just really focuses on the development. It, and when I mean plays, he'll play, but it's like mop up duty, back up if his number's called, but not bringing him in a niche role, which then gets him away from developing the areas that he needs to develop pocket passer, going through progressions, throwing on time. We know he can run. But if we're getting back to, to doing that, are we really helping him develop those other areas that we need we need him to develop to make more plays with his arm? So I'm I'm really constantly back and forth on that. I I really am. And um I get yeah, it, man. We'll see. I get it. I get it. We'll see. We have a super chat here from Presley Laypath. It says screw cancer. I agree with you wholeheartedly. We also have a super chat here from Nathan Milton for cancer strikeout. So we'll get to one of your questions here. Nathan, I don't know if I've seen any. If you've put in a question into the chat, just can you just redo it and we'll get to it? Or if you want us to answer the question that you brought up yesterday, either one, just uh, put that in there and we'll, we'll get to it. So we appreciate both of you guys for those. One for Mike Huff. Mike says, amazing story. I'm glad she pulled through my donation. Appreciate you, Mike. Really do. Really appreciate that. Uh, we got one from Catman85. He says, who comes in as the number three tight end when the offense is running two tight end formations with Holden Stace or Mitchell Evans need to be subbed for, you think, the freshman Cooper Flanagan? I, I think that Cooper could be that guy, potentially. It's it's tough for me to project that right now, though, because Cooper's not going to be a guy that's going to get here until the summer, right? Like, he's not in spring ball. I think right now, Brian, that guy is um, 38. What, I always forget his name for some reason. Um, Davis Sherwood. Davis Sherwood, yes, who is the fullback, H-back, kind of all over the place type of player who actually played a little bit last year. He did. So I think Davis Sherwood is that guy right now. But to your question, like projected to the future, could Cooper Flanagan get in here if Kev, if Kevin Bauman and Eli Raritan are still injured and carve out that role? It's possible. But I mean, as of right now, if you're asking me to who is that guy right now, I think it's Davis Sherwood as as we stand today. I agree again because there is nobody else right now. Yes. <laughs> I mean, other than him, I think if when Eli Raritan comes back, he'll obviously have a role there too. And yeah. and you know, I won't be shocked if Cooper Flanagan has some sort of blocking role as a freshman, especially yeah. with all the injuries that the position has kind of gone through right now. Probably at least on like goal line, short yardage stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like get Cooper right. Flanagan in the game because. Yeah, he's 255 pounds right now, Brian. So he's going to yeah. be a big cat oh, yeah. when he gets on campus, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> Matt Lass, appreciate you, Matt. Bleep cancer. I'm with you, man. I am with you on that. Absolutely. I have a comment from Omar Austin, and he says, uh, Golden's answer from the PC gave me hope, uh, some hope for the D-line and linebackers. How do you guys feel about it? And Ryan, with uh, Richardson being mocked before Young, why are teams not trading for Lamar Jackson? So uh, let me um, let me stick on the first one. First of all, he was referring sure. to something that Al Golden said about – they're, they're being able to take more time with the players and take more time in teaching and coaching. And uh, my answer to that is, Ryan, is if that's true, then that's phenomenal. I'm going to yes. believe it when I see it. But if I, this is – if if what you – and I haven't had a chance to listen to the press conference yet because I was prepping for the show today and just doing some other things. I'll listen to it later. I don't put a lot of stock in what coaches say at press conferences. I don't. Al Gold's a savvy guy. He knows what we want to hear. I care about what he's doing. And if we find out that he is spending more time on making sure the players know it and how to do it fundamentally and technically, then that's phenomenal. That's what we're calling for. That's what we were begging him for. And if he does that, he'll have a phenomenal year as the defensive coordinator. You know, combine your intelligence with what the players can handle technically and fundamentally and execution wise. And this defense is going to be very good. Very good. So yes, I'm 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 in, I'm encouraged if that's what we'd see. I just, you know. I'm at the point now, Ryan, I've been doing this so long. It's like, sounds great. Let me see it. <laughs> exactly. Let me see it. Can, yeah. can I can I address the, the the draft thing that a lot of people are just not understanding? And, and I'm curious what your thoughts on this, Ryan. Okay. Yes, Lamar Jackson's an incredible talent. Yes, he's a former MVP. Even if you take away the injury part of it, right? What you all have to understand is if I'm a team trying to rebuild, which is what teams in the top five are, in order to get Lamar Jackson, I got to give up two first round draft picks and pay him a maxed out basically a huge contract with guaranteed money, which means I'm losing the potential to add two premium draft players to the draft. And I've just committed a ton of money to one player. Whereas if I take CJ Stroud, he may not be Lamar next year. He may not ever be Lamar, but you know what he's going to be for the next five years? A whole lot freaking cheaper than Lamar 
which means I now have a lot of cap room to give to other people. Then you throw in the fact that Lamar's missed games each of the last two years, and he plays a style of game that is people do question, then I think that's valid. I personally don't buy that as much because I think Lamar's style of play is more about what the Ravens had him do. I still believe, if coached correctly, Lamar could be a much better pocket player than like a Robert Griffin III could have been, in my opinion. I think he has a much better feel for passing game. I saw We saw that in college. I've always felt Lamar had a lot more passing potential than an RG3 and guys like that. I think the Ravens never developed that. That's been an issue of mine. You've known that for a long time. But it's not just about trading that number one pick for Lamar. You're trading your number one pick this year. You're trading your number one pick next year. You're giving him a max, a huge deal, which limits your ability to rebuild because these are teams that are rebuilding. A quarterback isn't fixing that, right? Uh, it, he's just not fixing that. So I don't think that that's an answer for those teams that 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 need a lot of work. Lamar doesn't just walk. He's not the kind of player because he's not Pat Mahomes with all due respect. He's not the kind of guy that you put on a roster and all of a sudden you go from being four and 12, or four and 13 now to a Super Bowl contender. He's not. The Ravens have a lot more resources than the teams picking the top five this year, and he still could barely get them into the playoffs the last few years. So I just I, I just think that people need to realize this is a this is a business decision as as much as it is a football decision. And people have to look at it that way. And a lot of NFL players apparently don't get that. They don't understand that. That's my take on it, Ryan. I'm curious what your thoughts yeah. are on this. On this, I mean, I think the injuries is the big part, right? Like, I mean, it, it's one thing where you're – he's going to demand a lot of money, right? Like, he's going to reset the market. And when you're resetting the market, when a player has had durability issues over the last couple of years, it's, it's the risk versus reward type of conversation, right? Like, that's kind of all it comes down to for me is that it's a – is Lamar incredibly talented? Yes. Has he been very productive when he's been healthy? Yes. The answer is yes. But when you're putting so much money into a player, availability does matter, right? Like we can't just like skate by it and be like, oh, that doesn't matter. Especially because Brian, you made a, a good point is that when you're putting so much money into him, we know we talked about this roster construction is going to change because you're going to have less money to put in other spots. So if I'm if I'm putting into a player that might also not be available from time to time, then I've hurt my roster and I'm not getting the bank for my buck at the end of the day, right? Like that's kind of where it comes down to. And Omar, for your second parter about what's with Anthony Richardson being mocked before Bryce Young, <laughs> this is what I will say this time of year, sir. Stop reading mock drafts, please. All you know, just stop. The only mock draft I would read is Dame Brugler, the only one, because he is the only one, in my opinion, in that industry that includes Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay. All due respect, because Mel's the godfather of draft coverage. So, like, I'm not throwing shade at him. And you sound like the, him, but there's that too. You know, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Those guys are very click base oriented. Is there some analysis that comes in? Sure. Do they have intel into the league? Yes, they do. I'm not saying they don't. But mocking Will Levis number one overall and doing that type of stuff, it, there's just some stuff that you're not going to believe. I ultimately believe that Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud will be the first two quarterbacks off the board. That's that's my general opinion there based upon yeah. things I'm hearing and where we are. So some people's mocks, I just would not give the, the time of day. I think that Anthony Richardson is going to go in the top 10. Like There's no doubt in my mind in that regard. But I don't think he's going to go over Bryce Young. I think that's pretty far-fetched at this point. I said this, Anthony Richardson and Will Levis are very similar in that they're both very raw quarterbacks that you're taking a shot on. But I would take Anthony Richardson over Will Levis any day of the week. I don't think it's yep. even debatable for me, Ryan. I don't think there's that much of a difference of who they are now, but Will Rich Anthony Robertson Richardson is a redshirt sophomore who yep. started one year. Will Levis is a sixth-year senior who is is who he is. So when you're raw as a sixth-year senior, that's a problem. I'm sorry. That's a problem. So I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch them. I wouldn't. But the Lamar thing, I just, I, there's too many people that focus on the wrong part of this and just get all in their feelings about it. Cause they see Richard Sherman all upset about it. And you know, how would you, how could you take Brock Purdy over him? Well, I can't afford him. Like, you know, there's a salary cap thing, right? And I've got a lot of money in Trent Williams and Nick Bosa and these other guys. I can't afford Lamar. Yes, he's yeah. a better – no no one on the planet thinks he's a better – thinks Lamar Jackson's not a significantly better quarterback than Brock Purdy or even Trey Lance, but I can't afford to have him on my roster. 
right? I mean, that's the that's so, the this, the the economics of this sport. Can, can you know, a, a silly comment was just said. It's his agents that is killing it. That's it. Who's the agent? He he's his own <laughs> he's agent. Agents. He doesn't have an agent. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, that just who, made said, me laugh. who said that? My, I think Michael Campbell said it. it's the agent oh. that's killing it. Yeah. So himself, yeah. he's killing yes. it. Yeah, Lamar's sure. agent is Lamar. <laughs> <laughs> right and so oh. that's that's also i think part of the problem and and i've discussed that before but i'm i'm all about you being your own agent in between contract signings yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean like you know that that's just kind of the, the deal but um there's ridiculous yes. but yeah i mean it you just you have to look at it that way you know and it's well the browns the browns were stupid to give deshaun watson that kind of money that was dumb that was dumb. Other teams aren't dumb. And they say, well, the market's been reset. No, no, it hasn't. The Browns showed what they're willing to pay. Clearly, no one else is willing to give that kind of deal to Lamar Jackson. And there's only one reason for it. It it, it just it's way too risky. It's with if Ryan, you're talking about investing over two hundred million dollars in this guy. Yeah. I, I gotta have a lot of answers about that first. And can you put a team on your shoulders the way that the Pat Mahomes has? Has Lamar Jackson, as talented as he is, shown that he can do that the way that Pat Mahomes can? No, he hasn't. He hasn't. Now, yes, he's had Pat Mahomes had better players. There's no doubt. There's no Travis Kelsey for the Ravens. I get that. But Lamar just hasn't been proven he can be that kind of guy. I personally think, Ryan, he can be that kind of guy. And I'll sit there and pound on the table and say, yeah, I think he can be that kind of guy. But if you had said, hey, Brian, okay, fine. Put two hundred million dollars on that bet. Uh, no, right, I'm good. Right. Yeah. I'm good. That's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference. So that's where I'm at with that conversation, Brian. So I like talking this. I'm learning from you, man. See, you like that? Learning from you. Yeah. Here's yeah. one from Irish Eagle ninety who gave a huge super chat earlier. So we appreciate you very, very much, Ryan. The, qu the question is: Do you guys think having one receiver with a monster year or multiple receivers having a decent to good year? makes a greater impact with recruits. That's an interesting question. With recruits, I mean, it's the it's team success plus one guy having a huge year. Yeah. With most recruits. Well, let me rephrase. With the big-time recruits, with Ryan Wingo, it's going to be the one receiver having a monster year. Yeah. With the guy you're trying to get to be your third and fourth receiver, a Caleb Smith type, a Rico Flores type, a, a guy like that, it's the – Hey, look how many guys caught more than 30 passes. Exactly. Yeah. Like we get guys on the field and we help let guy multiple guys contribute. Sure. Yeah. That's a good point. It's a really good point. But the studs, the five stars, they want to know, can I go there and be a first round draft pick? It's right. so it's different for every player. Sure. Uh, if if I were to say, if I were to say, because like here's the thing, you know who the perfect example for the latter one is? It's Ohio State. Who's the receiver at Ohio State that's had the monster year that's in the NFL right now? The, the closest thing you can come to is Jackson Smith and Jigba, and he's, you know, he's he's kind of going, you know, he, he's built off last year. But Garrett Wilson never had a monster year at Notre Dame. I mean, at Ohio State, his best year was seventy catches for one thousand and fifty-eight yards and twelve touchdowns. That's good. That's not as good as what Will Fuller did. Not even close to what Will Fuller did. You know, I mean, th their thing was they had three guys that had a lot of yards. Yeah. You know, I mean, in two thousand nineteen. Ohio State didn't have a single receiver get to 900 yards. Like Jackson Smith and Jigba and Marvin, I'm going through this. Marvin Harrison Jr. are the only Ohio State receivers since going, I'm going all the way back to 2009 that have gone for over 1,100 yards receiving. And they've only, or uh, 1,200 yards receiving. They've had one, two, three, four, five, Paris Campbell. Since 2010, 2009, Ohio State's had five guys go for over 1,000 yards. That's it. Yeah. Because what they've made their living on is, dude, we have seven guys catching the football. <laughs> Seriously. Right? Yeah. And so, yes, you don't have to be a 80, 90 catch guy for 1,300 yards to be a first-round draft pick. Garrett Wilson barely made it over 1,000 yards his last year. He was a first-round draft pick. Chris Olave, do you know how many 1,000-yard you know seasons Chris Olave had in college? Zero. 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 And he was, where did he get picked? It was the top 15, wasn't 11, it? 11, 11th overall, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. never had, had – had only went over 900 once. Why? Because we spread the ball around. And yeah. that led to them getting the Marvin Harrisons and the Emekas and all that. And I would argue last year that having two guys that dominated the catches last year hurt Ohio State. 
because they couldn't spread the ball because there was a big drop off because of all the injuries after the top two guys. So I would argue that it hurt their offense not having the, the ability to spread the ball around the way that they could in past years. That's my opinion. I, you know, others may disagree, but so I mean, it, but you've got to you've, but see, but the reason the thing is there, though, Ryan, but the, the, that's countered by the NFL draft success. That's the difference sure. yep. in the NFL success. Says, hey, look, Michael Thomas never had a thousand yards, but look what he became. You know, I think that's the thing. That's when we circle back to what we talked about yesterday. It's the NFL. You got to be able to put guys in the NFL and have six and high draft picks and have success. Yep. In my okay, and we, and we, we got another one here about Lamar Ryan. Okay, and Christopher, thank you for the super chat. Says great cause. Thank you. Question: What do you guys think of the whole Lamar Jackson situation? I find it odd that one of the most stable organizations over the last two decades de- decades is taking all the blame. Are they taking all the blame? I don't yeah. see how they can take. Are they taking I, well, all from what I've seen? Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of people willing to criticize Lamar and how he's handling it. There's a few people, but then, you know, you you got to be careful how much you want to criticize Lamar in this conversation because, for obvious reasons. But I've seen, uh, and a lot of the Ravens organization stuff boils down to Greg Roman, right? Yeah. But then, like Lamar does this thing where the day that. J- 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 uh, Harbaugh is going to speak at the owner's thing. Lamar releases his whole thing about how he had asked for a trade. So I, I don't, I don't think Lamar's necessarily handled himself real well this whole process, like not traveling with his team to the playoff game. Like he did a lot of things to me that he deserves a lot more criticism for that. I'm disappointed in him to be honest with you. It's like, I know you got your financial stuff, but traveling with your team to the playoff game is something you're doing because you're the leader of this team. Right. I don't care if you're going to be the leader of the team next year or not. You're the leader of this team. And and I don't think he's catching enough criticism for that type of stuff. Well, it shouldn't affect whether I want him or not, if I really want him. But you know, he, what he's doing, Ryan, is he's kind of backing himself into a corner where the Ravens are no longer an option for you. Like, sure. And that's not where you want to be, in my opinion. Because if I know the Ravens aren't going to sign you now because you've burned that bridge, then where's your bargaining power? And this is why you need an agent. Well, that's, you know? that's why I think that, – that's why – I don't know. I'm just – I think both sides need some blame in this whole conversation, Agreed. right? I mean, the negotiations that happen. Negotiations are between two parties, not just one party, right? Like if something hasn't get done, maybe Lamar Jackson has overestimated his market, right? Like maybe that's a starting point. And then the trade stuff, like at some point, man, like I'm not going to trade a, a valuable asset for nothing if I'm the Ravens, right? Like I'm not just going to trade him away for anything. Like I think that would be silly. So I think both deserve a little bit. I, I did see in the chat that someone – um forget. I, I, th- I think someone was saying about his mom represents him or something like that. And yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Well, we can move past that though. <laughs> he, he represents himself and his mom is there with him. And yes, to me – that's fine when you're negotiating deals with for you know Nike or whatever else. But when you're doing these these type of contracts are are not pleasant when you're when you're like you've heard people say in baseball like avoid arbitration hearings because just so you know this the team has to be able to go in there and point out your flaws in order to pay you what they think they want to play you. It's it's not it's not a fun process. And then yes. when you're you got to let the agent have that battle. Right. Yep. And, you know, Lamar chose not to do that. And I, I think he's hurt himself because he doesn't have when someone guide him say, hey, man, like you, you probably shouldn't burn that bridge with the Ravens just yet. Make your presence known, make your feelings known. But you may not want to go that far because you're not going to help yourself. They both deserve blame to a degree. There's no quite. I don't think the Ravens have done a very good job of developing Lamar. I think they've pigeonholed. Right. They pigeonholed him into a this is who he is corner that I don't think he necessarily should be pigeonholed into, in my opinion. And, and- sure. Can I also say one more thing? Because I just I just want to make sure that there's not inconsistency in the chat as far as like knowledge of this. Because I think that that's what we're here to do is to to you know gain knowledge to people, right? Yeah. When you're when you're talking about when you're talking about a contract structure with an agent, right? Because I saw someone say that the Ravens have to pay an extra three percent to Lamar's agent, who's his mom. That's not how that works. Mm-hmm. Lamar would get paid the money, and if his mom is his agent, then she would get three percent of that money, right? Like the money on the table. Right. It's not an extra three percent. Like there's not an extra three percent that the Ravens have to pay an agent. That if money the, comes if out the of the agent total wants deal. his three percent, then he would just negotiate for a higher amount that the three exactly. percent would come out of. You're yes. correct. It doesn't go to. There's not okay. I'm paying you two hundred million dollars, and then three yeah. percent of that I got to pay to your agent on top of the two. No, I'm giving you two hundred million dollars. It's up to you to pay yes. your agent whatever you guys agree to. 
that th- that 3% comes out of the $200 million deal, not an extra 3% on the top of 200 million. Right. Like there's not, a, this isn't like a taxation thing that's happening here. <laughs> right. Right. All right. Let's get back to uh, some questions here about Notre Dame. Yes. And uh, <laughs> here, here's one, Ryan. I'll, I'll ask you this question from Charlie okay. Weiss's last belt loop. He says, what does the staff see in Sean Civiliano? I know he has size and uh six, two, three Oh five. I know they want big guys in the line. Would this be a good add to the 2024 class? He didn't look that big in person to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, yeah, he's listed between six two and six three and three hundred through. I've seen somebody say two ninety as well in the yeah. past. So, like, I don't know how big he is, but Charlie, I think. I mean, you just answered your question though. They see size, right? They see size. He's a, you know, he's a. He's got some good things on film, and he was very productive. Like, there's no doubt. I mean, would it be a good? I, it would. Look, he adds something that you don't have enough of there but there are better options on the on the on the there's better options on the on the on the board way better options right like like if you if you miss out on david pele pele and tj Lindsay, and you end up with sean civiliano like that's i'd say save the scholarship for next year you have owen wayful save the scholarship for next year give it to an end that's what i would do i just the film is 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 dominant against a really bad level of competition and that's where you know, I've always said I don't care what the level of competition is. It doesn't define you as a player. What it does, however, is it makes it sometimes a little bit more challenging to evaluate the player because I mean, this guy's dominant. Yeah. But then you got to project that. Okay, would he be doing this if he was playing against such and such? And then, like, the answer is no. Yeah. So um, I'm just I'm not in love with him as a player, but he's he's raw too. I mean, he hasn't played football for very long. I don't believe either, Ryan. So there's some stuff yeah. there. I just I'm uh, I'm not I'm not sure I would go there. Yes. For me, I'm just, yeah, I'm not Agreed. sure if I'm, if I'd be ready to go there. All right. Here's, here's one for Christopher Crosby. Thank you also very much for your super chat, Christopher. Yes. Appreciate it. The subject hits very close to home. So thanks to everyone who was able to help with this cause. Thanks to IB and staff for making this a priority. It means a lot to me to be a part of such a great community like this. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We're you. glad to have you part of it. Yeah. Absolutely. We've always said we want to build a community, not just have a show. Not yep. just have a revenue stream. It is a revenue stream. It is a show, but we want it to be more than that. We want it to be a community. And sometimes community Shut. comes together in different ways, whether it's yep. offering prayer for someone who needs it, support for someone who needs it, or when when things like this can come along and we can use our platform to bring awareness to a cause. I mean, how many of you all would have known about this fundraiser if we didn't do this, right? This is why we wanted to do it. This isn't about us. I mean, I'm just saying like, we have a platform. You know, when I kneel before God at the end of my life, I want to be able to say, you know, you gave me this blessing and I did my best to use it in a way that furthered your kingdom. Right. That's what I want to be able to do. And, um, you know, and that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. So um, I'm honored and I'm very grateful that Coach Gump was willing to spend time with us. I thought she was going to give us like 10 minutes. And she's like, no, no, you got 30 minutes. I was like, yeah, I got 30 minutes, Coach, no doubt. (laughs) So uh, that was awesome. That was awesome. It's really cool. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. And uh, here's one from Kay Grant. Kay, a big one. Appreciate you, sir, as always. I have a close family member who has cancer. I hate cancer. Cancer stinks. Also like this show and join the message board, everyone. Thank you, man. I agree appreciate with that you. last part, especially on top of the other stuff. <laughs> Definitely yes. join the message board, everyone. You can see the link down there, or you can see the web address down there, boards at irishbreakdown.com. Now we got another one here from Christopher Crosby. Christopher says Ohio State and Notre Dame had the best wide receiver holes last cycle. Whose overall class will turn out better when it all when it is all said and done, assuming health and things are not an issue? Sorry, Archer, got to take Notre Dame here, but it's close. Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say Notre Dame's turns out better because I think that Ohio State class has to deal with more competition in the years around it as far as getting guys on the field. Right. I mean, if you want to get on the field this year and your Cardinal Tater, Brandon Innes, you got to beat out Caleb Brown. You've got to beat out the the uh, the, uh, uh, the Koji kid from mm-hmm. Georgia. You've got to beat out. Um, I'm trying to drop the uh, Brian, uh, the Graves kid, Keon Graves from Arizona, who I think is a really good player. They got a kid from Texas, a really good player. And, and then they're going to sign some dudes next year. You gotta, you're going to have to hold off Jeremiah Smith, who they already have recur- you know committed in next year's class. So. If we're talking about you know who has a better chance to pan out, I'd say it's Notre Dame's because of that. Yeah. But when you talk about who had the better like players, 
I mean, I got to give the edge to Ohio State. Brandon Innes yeah. to me is better than anybody that Notre Dame has. And Innes Caleb Burton's a kid from Texas. Uh, yeah. Cardinal Tate's every bit as good as Notre Dame's best guy. They got two guys like that. Yeah. I would argue that Notre Dame's ceilings are much are 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 as high as the Ohio State kids. The ceilings are as high, but there's a. I have Braylon James and Jane Greathouse both as top hundred players. I have Rico Flores and Cam Smith as top one hundred and fifty players. I have Brandon Ennis as a top fifteen national fifteen national player. Yeah, you know, I mean that, that's the seeing it, seeing him in person yeah. too was like right. Oh, <laughs> it's a different well, cat, and and the yeah. other thing too is people forget Ohio State signed four receivers. The kid they got, the Bryson Rogers kid that they got, is a pretty good football player too. Yeah, and Noah Rogers is a top hundred player. They got three top hundred players. Notre Dame got two. And yeah. they got four top 200 players, which is the same number Notre Dame had. So, um, you know, th- that's why they get the edge. Now, my point about how Notre Dame's can end up panning out better is, is, like I said, for those four kids to get on the field, there's a lot more before and after them that they have to beat out than what the Notre Dame kids have to go against. It's just Tobias right now in the 23. Sure. Now, it could get more challenging if they're, you know, they already got Cam Williams in 24, right? And, and obviously, they can have another big class then, but – Right now, there's just a little bit of an easier path for the Notre Dame kids than yep. there is for the Ohio State kids. I agree. But that's there. that's where I'm at on that. But yeah, yep. I, I'd give the edge to Ohio to Ohio State. There aren't many others that I would do that with. I there's agree. maybe only two or three that I think are should be in the conversation with Notre Dame. Like Bama's, I don't like Bama's receiver class as much as I love Shelton Sam, uh, Sampson Ryan, and 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 I love Shelton Sampson as a player. He is really good. I don't like the rest of that class a receiver as much as I as much as I do. I I saw Selton Sampson like Rivals has him at number like 111. Have, did you see that kid's film? Yeah, there's no way in mines. freaking heck that there's 110 players better than Shelton. I don't know if there's 49 better players in the country than Shelton Sampson. Uh, Jalen Brown's a good player. Kyle Parker's a good player. Uh, Kai Preen's a good player. I just think Notre Dame's two through four is better than their two through four. But Sheldon Sampson's a dude. He's an he absolute is. dude. But there, that was a very that was also a very good receiver class. I just like Notre Dame's a little bit better. Um, you know, Ohio State's is a little bit better. I like Notre Dame's better than Alabama's. I'll I'll, I'll definitely say that. I mean, Alabama's got a oh, good yeah. receiving, a good class, no doubt a receiver. But I wouldn't trade Notre Dame's for their class. Cole Adams is very overrated. Uh, they got the the JUCO kid Malik Benson. He's a good player. Jalen Hale's yeah. a good player. He didn't progress as a senior as much as I like. Jaron Hamilton's not better, I think, than the guys Notre Dame got. If Cole Adams doesn't, if Cole Adams signs with, I don't know, Georgia Tech and not Alabama, he's not ranked where he's ranked. I'm sorry, he's not. Agree. Agree. So uh, Jalen Hale, I like a lot. He didn't make the jump as a senior that I thought he was going to make, though. He's talented. Though. He's talented. Yeah, he's a good. Yeah. It's, it's a great receiver class, Ryan. I mean, it was a yeah. great receiver class nationally, loaded receiver class. Yep. And that's how you could get you know guys who maybe aren't five stars but still have a great class. And a lot of where you're going to view Notre Dame is going to come down to where do you view Caleb Smith? That fourth guy can have a long way, a big determiner of where how you view that class. And I, I personally think that he's very good. Mm-hmm. Was a very good player. Let's get to some more here, Ryan. We got one from T Guns, my man T Guns. Tommy says, IB Nation, working nights this week, but had to wake up to pop in for today. Hope all is well. Glad to have you, man. Really glad to have you. We got a super chat here from Ape Gambino as well. I said, thank you for the job you guys do. Hashtag strikeout cancer. I am with you on that, buddy. Absolutely. Appreciate you very, very much. And appreciate all the support that you all are given. And we're way over $500 now. And and money raised just directly through the chest. We we might even get to the point where we actually get 500 total cut, not just 500 total, but the total cut may get closer there if we get a few more of these. Have another super sticker down here from CW Pura. Great, great guy. I'll say this now: when my mom got sick, he is a uh, he. He really stepped up and 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 uh, showed great support. So uh, that's my guy right there, Wade Garrett. Also, super chat. Thank you so much, Wade. No question for you too. Just here to support. We appreciate that also very much. John Bertucci, I think, gave two super chats. Here's one from him. Says, "Go Irish." He gave another one down here, which we greatly appreciate, John. And then uh, and then Michael Campbell, super chat. Thank you, Michael. Strike out cancer uh so we appreciate all you guys i thought this was hilarious ryan from ramlick carrot he was just busting your chops a little bit he says Wal- walter mock draft is where ryan gets his info that's a I, a, 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 f- I, a very funny uh don't yeah. here 
I will give people life advice here. Yeah. Here's life advice for you. Never go on to Walter football ever. Please don't go on Walter football. Yes. Uh, from a, from a, and now draft analysis perspective or just a general being a hu- good human being perspective. Do yes. not go on to work yes. football, please. That's sound advice. That is yes. very sound advice. And then we have a, 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 a big super chat from Corey O'Shaughnessy. We appreciate you, Corey, very much. Longtime listener who doesn't comment, but I enjoy your content and hate cancer. Go Irish. We certainly appreciate your appreciation of our content. And then we all agree cancer sucks, buddy. I appreciate that. Very, very much. Let's get back to questions we have up here, Ryan. But I did want to give some thanks out to those folks. We have one here from Nathan Milton. His question is, which will be better, 2024 offensive line or defensive line? 2024? Ooh. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, think we're talking about we're talking about recruiting, right? Recruiting? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nathan, are you talking about recruiting or are you talking about um, team? But recruiting-wise... It's a good question. I mean, there's a big question marks on both if, sides of the ball. If they get Justin Scott, I think it's going to be defensive line recruiting, in my opinion. But I'd have to, I'd have to see, I'd have to see who else they get. Yeah, like if it's Justin Scott and like Sean Civiliano, he said recruiting, and um, yeah. you know that's it. And the offense gets Gearby Lambert and you know some other guys I like. Then yeah, sure, I might give. I you know to me. To me, I'd, 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 if they get Justin Scott, I'd probably lean towards Ryan, but I think they need to get a couple – like they need to get a a couple other good players, like a Logan Thomas. If they get Justin Scott yeah. and Logan Thomas and some guy, along with Owen Wafel, who I think is very underrated. I love Owen Wafel as a player. Then I think it'll end up being the D-line as of right now. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very curious how the offensive line is going to shake out, Ryan, because – no, it, 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 we'll talk more about that tonight. We'll just, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk more about that tonight. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's get to some more here, Ryan. Here's from Ant Br. Ant's question: In your opinion, what are the what are the top five head coaching jobs in college football? It's a very good question. So here's an interesting one. Alabama is a top five job now, and it'll be a top five job for Nick Saban's replacement. It will not be a top five job for Nick Saban's replacement. Because the pressure that will be on the guy that has to replace Nick Saban is going to be to the point where there's no way you can live up to the expectations. It's kind of like Ron Zook. Ron yeah. Zook was basically the the sacrificial lamb to bridge the gap between Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer, right? But there was just like no way. And, and, and honestly, Ohio State kind of had that because you had that year of Luke Fickle, which was a disaster. And yeah. then Urban Meyer replaces him and all, you know. So it's going to be a tough job for whoever replaces Nick Saban. Just because the expectations are insane, I, I think um, I think one that you just said that I think would be a really good job if it came open is Ohio State. Though I think yes. Ohio State would be one of the top jobs, even though like, it's, insane fan base, but just tons yes. of support and tons of resources. Agree. You're in a great state. I think that's a great job. I mean, I I think Notre Dame's a top five job, uh, or can be a top five job. But right now, the administration needs to step up to the plate and make it make it so. Uh, yeah, but. I would say right now I probably wouldn't make it a top five job just because of the, some of the stuff that the school is not doing to support the football program financially, salaries and staff support and all that. It's hard for me not to say Georgia as a top five job. I mean, I, I think, I think so. We got Alabama, yeah. we got Ohio State, you got Georgia. I think Texas is a top five job. I mean, there's nowhere you're going to yeah. get better resources. It's a great in-state situation. Uh, I think that's a, gr- I think that's a great, great job. Getting yeah. the number five is tough, Ryan, because there's a yeah. like this is why it should be easily Notre Dame, but you know they're just yeah. not supporting. But I don't think Michigan's a top five job. I know people think it is. I don't think it is. USC to me is not a top five job in my opinion. A lot of people think it is. I don't think it is. You know, Miami, Florida State are not top five jobs. LSU, sort of mm, yeah. in the conversation. It's in the conversation. I don't know if I'd put it in there. Uh, trying to t- Tennessee is a great job. I think Tennessee and, might be one that I would view as a, a, a I, I think Penn State's a great job. Yeah. Like I, I don't know if I'd put it top five, but I think that's a great job. Great in state support, decent. I mean, between Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland, DC, you've got a really strong recruiting base, uh, tons of financial support. I'd at least they're in my conversation, to be honest I, with you. I, I think that for me, I, I think. LSU might be in my five, but they would barely eke out. I mean, they're yeah. 
because I, th- I think that between you... a, there's a big do, would you say there's a big drop off between the first four we mentioned yeah, Texas 100%. Ohio State Alabama and Georgia there's a pretty yes, big drop off I would I would I would say Oklahoma is close to being a top five job for me ish I mean not the right reason, now because the, the reason I say depleted, no but... is because to me Ryan to be a great job you need a great recruiting you need a great base recruiting area. And they can recruit Texas well, but they'll never be the dogs in Texas if Texas is good. Sure. Because what the schools – and that's why George is in the top five now, and they weren't – 20 years ago, I would not have had George as a top five job. You didn't have the same level of tradition, but also you didn't have the home state base. Now, Georgia's just takes such a huge jump in, uh, in um, producing big-time players, Ryan, in the last 20 years that that's, that's made it a great job. Yeah. USC 15, 20 years ago is without question a top five job because California was so loaded and it's just not as loaded anymore. That's the reason why I don't have Oregon as a top five job. Oregon's a great school for football in a lot of ways, but you've got to travel to recruit players. There's, you know, Oklahoma does as well to a degree. That's the only thing to hold. Like, that's why I would take LSU over Oklahoma, right? Because Louisiana's got a much better base and then LSU can go into Texas and Florida as well just like Texas can. So that that'd be yeah. that's the only reason there but that comes down to right what is your criteria for a top 5 job which sure. we didn't really establish. Well, why well, I, I was thinking of as like if I'm a coach what would be attractive to me as far as what a job could give me. You know one Brian that's going to shock some people that Mike Hoge Ho just put in the chat Texas A&M is a pretty desirable job to me if that job comes open because there's going to be talent there. You're in Texas. I don't know, man. I feel like that could be a really – like if you're a good coach, yeah. I feel like that could be a – it could be a, a one where you turn it really, around quick. It's a top 10 to 15 job, but I've never felt it was as good of a job as people make it to be because uh, here's why. Great financial support, great resources and all that, but you're nev- it's hard for me to pick a school to be number in the top five when you're never going to be the number one school in your state. Right now, you may have a better football team than the number one, but like Auburn in years where Auburn was made a better football team than, than Alabama, they're still the number two school in the state. Right? I mean, Michigan State may have years where they're better than Michigan, they're still the number two school in the state. And that's kind of that's kind of thing that 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 hurts me a little bit with Texas A and M, and they don't have the tradition that people think that they do either. I mean, they haven't won a championship. Some what freaking Bear Bryant was there, or something like that. I mean, did they even win one when he was there? So uh, that's um, that's one for me. I don't think Nebraska can be a top five job anymore. It's a good job. I, Nebraska can be. It's not what it was thirty years ago. It's not. Yeah, it in just, the nineties, we could have a different yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah. So I, but yeah, right. I mean, you could make a case for like you can make a case for Texas A&M, and then I can pick it apart, and then I can make a case for LSU, and then you could pick it apart. That's that's the thing is like the, after the top four, there's a lot of tough ones, and that's why I get pissed off at Notre Dame because if they would support the football team the way that they should, not my lower yeah. academic standards and all that. My spending money the way you should be spending money. Notre Dame should be a top five job. It's got tradition. It's got history. It's got a tremendous academic situation. It's it's situated in an area where they can recruit. They can recruit nationally as well as any team in the country. But they just don't support the football team the way they need to, in my yep. opinion. And that's what holds them back. I, I think Flo- I think Florida would be a job if they weren't just so crazy and just fire people so quickly. You right. Know what I mean, like from a but, coaching. Yeah, like, that's that's part of it, though, right? I mean, that's the kind of yeah. thing that that can make the job not. A, that's why I don't think Auburn's a great job because yeah. Auburn fans think they're Alabama and they're not, and they're ex. I mean, look, you know, some of these jobs people think are great jobs, like Clemson. To me, I don't know if Clemson's. A, I think Dabo made it a great job. I don't think it's necessarily a top. It's a good job. Don't get me wrong, but it's. I don't know if it's a top five for me because yeah. selling the ACC is a little different to me. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, it's, it's a, and, and no, I don't think Iowa is a better job than Nebraska. It's well, I mean, not. I mean, I, I would love to be an Iowa offensive coordinator. All I have to do is yeah. average 25 points a game. And I get that's a payout. It. So that's it. Yeah, I was a, Iowa is a better program and has been for years, but being a better program doesn't define the job. Right. The job is: Do you have in-state recruiting ability? Well, neither Nebraska or Iowa really have a ton of that. It's about alumni base. It's about money. It's about resources. It's about all that. And Iowa doesn't spend the way that Nebraska does. 
Sure. Right. You could you could argue that Nebraska, what brings Nebraska down a little bit, Ryan, is they don't have the realistic view of who they should be anymore, like they like other teams. But um Tennessee, Tennessee would Tennessee would be in there if not for the same problem. They have a very unrealistic fan base. Yeah. Like you're not who you think you are. And if they had a more realistic thing, then that would be a much better job. Yeah. Right. Right. And again, we're not talking about programs. We're talking about jobs. Right. So like right now, Cincinnati is a better program than Florida. I don't think anyone would argue that that's a better job than Florida. That's kind of where I'm where I'm coming from it at that point in time. So, all right, let's get some more here, Ryan. I want to get through these super chats here so we can get ready for the next show at 530. Here we go from Tyler Smith. Tyler's question, what's the greatest college football team you have ever witnessed? Talked about this a little bit yesterday. I mean, it probably owe one yeah. Miami for me, probably. Yeah. <sighs> Collection of talent anyway. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Oh, one Miami was phenomenal. 94, was it 95 Nebraska was yes. in that conversation <laughs> yep. for me. Um, 2019 LSU is in that conversation for me. Yep. They they are. I'm trying to remember which Nebraska it was 95. I think it was 95. Yeah, that th- this is what Nebraska did in 1995. They beat Oklahoma State 64 to 21. <laughs> beat Michigan State on the road. That was on the road, Ryan. They beat Michigan State on the road 50 to 10. Uh they beat Arizona State 77 to 28. Right. These are power five teams that was a nick saban coached michigan state team that that went that was had a winning record arizona state had a winning record beat pacific 49 to 7 beat washington state 35 to 21 beat missouri 57 to nothing beat number eight kansas state 49 to 25 beat number seven colorado on the road 44 to 21. Colorado finished that year ranked fifth. They beat them 44 to 21. Beat Iowa State 73 to 14. Beat number 10 Kansas, who finished ninth that year, 41 to 3. They beat Oklahoma 37 to nothing. And then they beat Steve Spurrier in Florida in the national title game 62 to 24. That was the most dominant team I've ever seen. Now, is that the best team? Uh, you know, there's other in the conversation. Like that Miami team was the most talented. It was yes. clearly the most talented. But that 95 Nebraska team was insane. And and I'll tell you this, those Nebraska teams back then are one of the few teams that you could look at and say they could can potentially compete with Miami when you look at the stable of running backs they were putting out there. You know what I mean? Like I think it might have been 1994 – uh nebraska you had like uh, amon green wasn't even a starter on that team it's wild like yeah i mean you had you you had amon green was because lawrence phillips got suspended that year but you had lawrence phillips on that team you had uh joel makavica at fullback who was a longtime nfl player um yeah, i mean you, you you that team was loaded uh, and that defense on that 95 nebraska team had some athletes on it man but that they had some dudes back then. So I'd, I'd yeah. say Nebraska 95 was probably the most dominant team that I've ever seen. I mean, man, they didn't have a close game. I mean, let me look at it. What's the closest game they had all year? It was 35 like to 21 against Washington oh. State. Yeah. 14 points. They won by 43, 40, 49, 42, 14, 57, 24, 23, 59. 38, 37 in the national title game, they won by 38. It's wild, man. And they played, let's see here. They played Kansas State, Colorado, and Kansas and Florida. So you talk about they they beat the end of the year, they beat the number two team in the country, end of the year rankings, 62 to 24. They beat the number seven team in the country, end of the year rankings, 40. Nine to twenty-four, five. They beat the number five team in the country end of year rankings, forty-four to twenty-one, and they beat the number nine team in the country end of the year ranking, forty-one to seven. I'm sorry, forty-one to three. 
Like that is nuts. It's not so bad, man. I'm actually gonna have to go because Miami that year in 01 had a couple really close games. Virginia Tech, Boston College. Remember that long uh, fumble return yeah. where the D lineman flipped it back to Ed Reed. Uh, <laughs> they had a couple ug- ug- ugly wins, but that team was loaded. But yeah. the '95 my Nebraska game never had a close game. Was, did have you ever watched that Orange Bowl between or Fiesta Bowl between Florida and uh, Nebraska? No. I would encourage I've, you. To I've do watched it, like highlights of Tommy Frazier yeah. and stuff like yeah. that, but I've never watched the game in the entirety. No. I would encourage you, just for fun, to one of these days soon, to because the, the whole game's on on YouTube. It yeah. is to watch the the nineteen ninety five Fiesta Bowl between Florida and um, Nebraska. I mean that was that was Danny Warfel, Chris Doring. I mean there's like Nebraska had like three NFL or Florida had like three NFL receivers in that team. Like that was a really good Florida team that year. They finished that year 12 and one. They beat Florida State by 11, beat number 23 Arkansas in the SEC title game 34 to three, beat Auburn that year, was ranked in the top 10, 49 to 38, beat a ranked LSU team 28 to 10, beat number eight Tennessee 62 to 37. Like that was a really good Florida team. Yeah. And they got m- destroyed. Destroyed. They beat Georgia that year at Georgia 52 to 17. Got destroyed by Nebraska. You should watch that game. That was a phenomenal. I'm going Nebraska 95. It's the best team I've ever seen. Best Notre Dame team I've ever seen is actually the 89 team, not the 88 team. The 88 team won the title, but the 89 team was better. It just they played Miami on the road that year. That was a tremendous Notre Dame team in 1989. Like I've said this to you before, Ryan. I think they beat seven ranked teams that year, that 1989 Notre Dame team, and most yeah. of them were not close. They beat number two Michigan by five, 24 19. They beat Air Force 41 27, beat USC 28 24, beat Pitt, number seven Pitt 45 to seven, beat number 17 at Penn State on the road 34 to 23, and beat number one Colorado in a bowl game 21 to six. That was a really good team. Yes. That was a really good team. Yeah. But think about and then oh, and they beat Virginia, who finished that year 18th. That was a that was a team with Sean Moore and Herman Moore beat them yeah. thirty six to thirteen in the opener on a neutral field. So, oh man, I've got my yeah. Herman Moore. Herman yeah. Moore was awesome. Yeah, Notre Dame destroyed that team. I think they had Chris Slade on that team. I believe was on that team. So yeah, that was probably the best Notre Dame team I've ever seen. Was eighty nine, even though they didn't win the title. The eighty nine team was was big time, big time. Here we go. Here's one from J Wick thirteen. His question. What are you most looking forward to seeing at the spring game? I cannot wait to see how Tyler Buckner does in the face of tougher competition at quarterback. Also, we're still waiting on Ryan to grow the stash. When was I ever supposed to grow a mustache? We had I talked about a beard. You yeah, said beard. you could. You said you said you could grow a mustache. I can grow a mustache. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's said, not. It's yeah. not attractive though. It's just a mustache. Yeah. You know, like nah. Yeah. But. Yep. Yeah. Uh, something to can't consider. People said this is why they think Nebraska can come back. The problem is Nebraska made a, a, a the state of Nebraska was different back then. Nebraska was in a conference that made sense, and they they got a decent amount of JUCOs back then. And the JUCO game is just isn't what it used to be. That's the yeah. other part of it too. It just it doesn't. It's not the feeder that it used to be, in my opinion. All right, let's get to some more here, Ryan from Chase Talk Sports. Chase Talk Sports says, just got on the show for today. One, do we know if there will be a blue gold draft? Two, what's your favorite alternate jersey Notre Dame football has ever wore? Mine is the original green jersey. So, Chase, thank you very much for your super chat. I appreciate that. Um, I don't know if there will be a draft. I'm not sure how they're going to separate the teams, uh, to be honest with you. I personally don't like – I think the draft is fun. As a coach, I don't like it. I want us. I want to be able to decide why I want certain guys together. I want to see this offensive line tandem working together. Now, what I may do is I may put groups together. Okay, this group of D linemen, this group of offensive linemen, this group of receivers, and you can pick that group and go that way. But I, I, I would, I personally, uh, I personally would, um, would uh, not do it that way, just for me. But that's because I'm a coach. I understand why people do it because it's for fun. It's the buy. It's like the coach comes with some of the buy-in. It is fun. You know, it you know, it's, it, it, there's a lot, there's a lot to that in my opinion. Yep. Uh, favorite football, Notre Dame Jersey, alternate mm-hmm. Jersey. Yeah. I liked, yeah. I'll tell you which one, you know, which one I really liked. 
and there's been a couple. I really like the 2011, uh, 2011 Michigan jerseys. The road, the the road game jerseys from from back then. Yeah, I thought those were really good. It was uh, they had gold pants. They had a white jersey with green numbers, and then the green stripe on the shoulder, and then they had a shamrock on the helmet. It's the only time I've ever oh, actually yeah, yeah. liked them that uh, putting something on the helmet. It's the only time I ever did. I'm gonna see if I can find a photo of it. But um, the 2015 jerseys were sweet looking in person, Ryan. They just didn't look good on TV. Those yeah. are pretty sweet. I know a lot of people like the 2013 against um, Arizona State, the all white against Arizona State. I looked that one up. Yeah. Oh wait, I know. I know, I remember that one. I remember yeah. that one. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up the um, I'm gonna pull up the ones from 2011 that I really liked and see some people see what people think of them. Let me find a good a good view of of the jersey. There's got to be some good ones here. I didn't like the ones that Michigan wore that day and the big block M on the front. I thought those looked oh, yeah. <laughs> but I thought I thought those Notre Dame jerseys that day were pretty sweet. I, I actually really liked them. Let me find a good one. All right, there's there's a good one of Sierra Wood running. Let me find that one. All right. So here we go, Ryan. Here's the that one from that game. So let me just share this real quick. So share. Is this the Sierra Wood in it? So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought those were pretty sweet. I liked those. I thought those alternates were really sweet. Yeah, they're nice. They're yeah, nice. I remember. I, I remember those. those. Yeah, yep, I liked those a lot. I like those a lot. I'm trying to think what other years. I don't like the traditional green with the gold. I just, I, I've never really loved that, to be completely honest with you. Never mm-hmm. been a huge fan of that. Any others you liked, Ryan? Um, I like the ones that you just showed. I'm trying to think. I'm more of a traditionalist, though, to be honest. Like, I kind of just like, just like the tradition a little bit, man. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I'm going to have yeah. to think about it a little deeper. I know what I'd like. I've said this before. Yeah. I'd like for them to do. I'd yeah. like for them to. I've said this before. Green jersey is an alternate. Green jersey, gold helmet, white pants. That's what I'd like to see him do. I would think that would be a sweet alternate alternate uniform. Very I, sweet I, alternate uniform. I'm still having trouble visualizing it. I need someone to draw it up yeah. for me. Yeah. I, if, I knew, if I knew how to do that, I would definitely do that. Uh, yeah. Brian and then Brandon, Brandon Plenzer asked this with a super chat. Thank you, Brandon. Any updated measurables for Civiliano or Thomas? Don't, yeah. don't have them. Okay. Brandon, I told you, man, I'll share them if I get them. Come on, on the man. board. I promise. The, we promise. Yeah. We promise. Yeah. All right, let's go to Michael Campbell uh, with super chat. Thank you, Michael, for the cause. Just post more QB to wide receiver and tight end videos and get our guys' names are out nationally for NIO money. I agree, Michael. They definitely need to be doing more of that. There's no yep. doubt about it. And then, uh, so Nathan Milton gave a super chat earlier, Ryan, okay. that uh, for supporting the call. So he followed up with a question. So this is the thing he had yesterday. And I'm gonna, have you ever seen Goodwill Hunting? It's my favorite movie of all time. Okay. So yes, I Good. have. Yep. So I was. I don't have to disrespect you then for not knowing that one. No. Okay. So he says, uh, Brian, Goodwill Hunting moment where Ben Affleck is taking an interview for da- Matt Damon. If Jay Scott replaces Affleck and demands from you, he'll only commit to Notre Dame if it's aired on IB. By Jack Swarbrick, what do you do? What would you say, Brian? I mean, <laughs> I'd ask Jack to do it and realize that Notre Dame's not going to get Justin Scott because there's no way in heck Jack is going to do that. <laughs> so there's no chance Jack Swarbrick would do that. No why, chance. Why does, I'd why ask. Does, why does everyone assume that I don't watch movies? I just because don't you don't watch a lot of movies that we bring up. Well, I mean, just start bringing up better movies, and then I'll be able to join in the fun. Okay. Sure. <laughs> when you're the primary one that doesn't like all those movies, it's a good chance it's. You. I'm just kidding. You just brought up a couple yeah. movies I haven't seen. Yeah. It's not like yeah, a couple movies. You a couple movies. Seen. Yeah, a couple. That's movies. funny. That's couple. funny right there. It's, it's all been right. Like two. Um, it's been like two movies <laughs> per show. All right, yeah, we have a super sticker from Kevin Horton. Thank you uh, very, very much for that. Very, very much for that. A couple interesting questions here, Ryan. Uh, here, here's one from uh, Omar Austin that I'm going to ask for you as we wrap up here. He says, if you're Jerry Jones, do you trade Dak for Lamar? Straight up? Or am I, or is there, I, I, Omar, I feel like, is there more to this compensation on either side? Or am I saying Dak for Lamar straight up? Like, that's it. Mm-hmm. 
If that's it, then yeah, I'm doing that in a heartbeat. Like Lamar Jackson's a better player than Dak Prescott, in my right. opinion. He is, and Dak's getting paid a lot of money too. So it's right. not like you're you're not you're hurting if, if if yes, if it was a deal where I could just trade them straight up, knowing straight I up. have to sign Lamar to a big contract. Heck yes, hundred percent. Yeah. Here's the what if it was a thing where the Ravens were going to say, um, you got to give up the two first round draft picks. Not two first. Now I, I would honest. I think I would do though. L- Lamar and wait. So I'm just thinking this through. So if the Ravens said you have to give us Lamar and one first, I think I would do it. One first, not two though. Two's too much. I think I, I would. Do I'd be willing one. to give up one. I think just one and the I, I would give up a yeah. future pick. I would try to negotiate a few like next year's first rounder. Which I if if I get Lamar, I think it's going to be a lot lower. Yeah, in my opinion, that would be one. Yes, I think I'd probably go there. I'm not a big yeah. Dak Prescott fan. I'm really Dak's not. just fine, man. He's yeah. he's he's good. He's fine. Yeah, I would definitely make that trade. Yeah. And, and it's not like here's the thing. It's not like Dak has a history of just being healthy all the time either. Like Dak has the same issues that Lamar has, but not the talent that yeah. Lamar has. Is that fair to say, Ryan? Like it, Lamar's younger. Yeah, similar big contract. Yep, still a checkered injury history. Yep. But Lamar's younger and has more, better talent. That's Agreed. the way I look at it. I agree. So yeah. I'm not a big Dak guy, man. Like that's yeah. fine. He's a good player. I agree. He's, agree. He's yeah, not. that's it. He's a solid NFL player. But that's the problem in today's NFL. You have to pay solid players like they're stars at quarterback, and that's the problem. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Dak's like a borderline top ten quarterback in the NFL, right? right? And it's like Lamar's a top five quarterback when he plays. Lamar's like in the second tier of quarterbacks when he's healthy. Yes. Right, he's not in that top tier of you know Pat Mahomes, Josh Burrow. Allen, Joe Burrow, and yeah. uh, you know Aaron Rodgers if he's can get back to what he was a couple of years ago. Right, but uh, he's he's definitely in that second group of guys, and it's a small yeah. group, second group of guys, in my opinion. And then we're gonna wrap up here. We got one from Chris Irish Young. I'm running behind, but it was my first live show in a while. Wanted to contribute. Thanks for doing this, guys. Chris, thank you so much for what you gave, man. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, means a lot. We are. I, I have a feeling we're well past five hundred dollars of what we're gonna receive. Not we're way past five hundred for what we're the, the net, the gross revenue. And I'm thinking we might get close to five hundred for for the net as well. That's that's big time, man. Really, really appreciate that. And then the last one here, Ryan, is with so – I'll ask this for you. It With so many Mike linebacker offers out in 24, could you see Notre Dame taking a class of three guys who project to Mike at the next level, some three-man combo of uh, Kingston, Viliama, Asa, uh, J- uh, Cole Sullivan, Aaron Childs. Uh, what's the Shaw kid's first name? The um, one that's it's, it's with a B. It's with a B. Every time I see um, the last name Sean with a B, I always want to say Bernard Shaw, but that's me. Yeah, uh, it's in, in, getting second. back to my CNN days when I was a kid. Is his uh, his first name is? I don't know why I'm blanking on this. I, is it uh, Brandon? Is it Brandon Shaw? It's on the. It's on the. Uh, there's an. I forgot to update the message board or the visit board, Ryan. But it's there's the. Here I'm pulling it up right now. It's on the okay. it's on the the website. It's, it's, it's B Shaw. It's B Shaw. Yeah, it's Bradley Shaw. Bradley, Bradley Shaw. Shaw. Bradley Shaw. Yeah. By the way, Rent, I did not add those kids to that the post that I made yesterday. I did not add them to the visit board. If you could add them to the visit board, I already did. On the visit okay, board. perfect. Yeah, perfect. On the visit board. Yep. And then we did get one final super chat, Ryan. We're going to end after this one, and this is from that one guy, fifteen. He says, "If you're Indianapolis, would you give up two first round picks for Lamar?" Versus Richardson or or Will Levis? Would I give up two first for Lamar versus Richardson or Instead Levis? Taking Richardson or Levis a four is what I think is what I I probably would just take Richardson instead of giving up two firsts. I think I not think. Levis. If Richardson, yeah, oh gone, definitely not. Oh, if Richardson, Levis. let's just say hypothetically one, two, and three yeah. is let's say Stroud goes one, Bryce Young goes two, and who's picking third, Ryan? Right now it's the Cardinals. They're probably going to trade that pick. Okay. Let's just yeah. say hypothetically, some team trades into number three and takes Anthony Richardson. Right. I am not taking Will oh. Levis. No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I would yeah. maybe consider that <laughs> trade then. I, I yeah. Would. No, I, I would. I definitely would. Yeah, I would. I would definitely consider it if my if my options were Will Levis or uh, Lamar Jackson. There's no oh, doubt about that. Gracious. <laughs> no doubt about yeah, that. There's, that's a no brainer. I actually missed a super chat, Ryan, or from John A. One. I can't believe I did that. 
Uh, sorry, John. He says, does big end have to be more physical or technical? I think it's imperative for a big end to be both. Yes, 100%. Yeah. It has to be both. I mean, you literally can't sacrifice one for the other. Because if you're not technically sound, you're giving up the edge. You're not setting the edge effectively. You're losing leverage that you're getting run on. I think what made Khalid Kareem so good at Notre Dame mm-hmm. is he was physical, but he was very assignment and physically sound. He was yep. not an explosive athlete, He was, but he was long. He was always in good position. And, um, you know, it, yeah, uh, he, he was there. I just – I think that's what you – that's what you have to be. That's yeah. what you have to yeah. be. You have, you have oh. to be physical. There's no and doubt. And, yeah. We never answered Brandon's question. Oh, about the we, mic question. Yeah, we kept, we kept trying to remember the kid's name, but by the time we remember the kid's name, <laughs> oh. we didn't a- answer the question. Yeah. Uh, so some three man combo of those guys. Where does Cole project? I don't think Cole Sullivan projects as a Mike linebacker at all. I, I don't think Cole's is a, a Mike, and I think that Aaron Childs also might be a Will. Yes, more agreed. than a Mike as well. Cole Shaw could play is, Will too. Yeah. he could play Will as well. To me, Sullivan is a Will that could grow into a Viper. Yeah, that's what I see from him. I yes. think Kingston is a Mike, and I think Peyton Pierce is a Mike. Yes, and Kingston is better than Peyton Pierce in my opinion. Right. And like so, you know, at two year, two three years now, can Aaron Childs be a playmaking Mike? Sure, but like he's not necessarily a. I mean, he's definitely not a Mike early. I don't. It's think, not in ideal, my in my right. opinion. It's not ideal. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, Brandon. We spent so much time trying to remember the kid's name that by the time yes. we got there, we forgot to answer the question. Yeah. So I apologize for that very very much. Um. But uh. Yeah. I mean. I, I would consider two mics and then one will sure. type. Like as long I would as one of those that. mics had a chance to do something different. You know, yeah. like I don't know if I want two pure mics. Like I don't want right. two junior, two Alamacas, but I take one yes. junior and one Drake Bowen, for example, type of guy. Right. Because right. Drake can do multiple things. That's yeah. where I would be. That's where I'd be. So yeah, good stuff, man. Good stuff. And again, sorry about that. We <laughs> we 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 didn't answer the question, but now we finally got to it. So um anyway. Everybody, thank you all so much for being with us today. I, I hoped, I hoped that you all would have stepped up to the plate, and you did. Not just with ch- uh, comments here, but also I know for a fact that a lot of people that are part of, that are part of our site, Ryan, have also given straight donations to this company, which I would encourage you to do. If you're listening to this uh, on delay, or if you're not listening to this live, obviously uh, there are you can give a super sticker if you want to. I would encourage you not to do that. I would say give directly to the fundraiser. There's a link in the description box below. You can go there. Uh, Definitely, definitely want to do that. Since we started this show, they were at uh, about 29.4 since we started the show. They're now up over 31,000. So there's a a lot of people that are giving for different reasons. Uh, But obviously some of those people, I recognize some of the names that are are part of our crew as well. So I appreciate y'all so much. I will... I will do this when when it takes 24 to 48 hours for Google to update the revenue, the cut of revenue. What I'll do is I'll take a screenshot of that and then I'll take a screenshot of the IB donation that we'll make that I'll make on all of our behalves and we'll go from there. So um, I'll also count up like what the total number of, of super chats were during the show. Uh, I mean, I stopped counting, Ryan. We were about 600 way past that. We were over 600 when I stopped counting. So we, you guys, you all did great and I appreciate it very, very much. And so, uh, check out on Twitter next couple of days. I'm going to, when we get the final number, the final tally, I will make a donation in the name of it will be Irish breakdown. So you all can see how much, uh, how much you all did and what you all did. So I appreciate it very, very much. Hey folks, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast. And don't forget five 30. So a little over an hour, we're going to be going live again. And we're going to be covering the, the uh, pending decision of uh, Anthony Knapp. We'll have some things to say about that once he makes his decision. And we'll go from there. And then Ryan and I will be back tomorrow, 1 o'clock, for another episode of the Irish Breakdown Podcast.